weekend from Bat City Comic Professionals. As usual, I'm Shannon, a.k.a. Small Press Shan, and I am joined by my buddy, Wednesday Phil. How's it going, Phil? Uh, I'm doing well. Excited to be here. It's been a busy weekend. I literally thought you said sorry to be here, and I was like, oh, oh God, I apologize. <laughs> I'm really happy that you're here, Phil. <laughs> um, I was I was concerned very briefly that we weren't going to be able to do this this week. And it was going to be sad to me because on Wednesday I came in and I read so many wonderful books and I was like, if we don't do it this week, it was all for nothing. I was I was so proud of you for how many books you read on Wednesday. You were so on top of your game. You were like, I'm going to read some books right now. And I was like, whoa, that's like on time. <laughs> <laughs> who does that? Like well, who actually reads books in? It was very helpful that I came into the shop and you immediately were like, you want to see all the great books we have to read this week? And I was like, yeah. And you just you hyped them up. Right, I gotta do it that way, because usually yeah. I'm like, I have so many books to read on Snapchat, and you're like, uh, what does that mean for me? Yeah. And I'm like, it means you have a lot of books, too. So yeah, I definitely need to start telling you, like, Phil, the books this week are incredible. There's just also 42 of them. <laughs> yeah, um, I, it's tough to keep up with your ability to read comics. It's so quick. And sometimes when uh, we're sitting here before the show reading, and I see you just throw like three or four down into the pile, and I'm still like four pages into one, I'm like, how does she do it? <laughs> it's impossible. It's, yeah. it's witchcraft. That's that's legitimately the answer to that question. Um, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, since we're winding down our weekend, uh, and we hope that you are too, um, if you're watching us live on Facebook, if you're watching us during the week, you know, wind down whatever day you're on. Uh, and, you know... It's a good way to it's a good way to relax and enjoy your comic books, and uh, we are going to do that today with this Behringer Brothers Bourbon Barrel uh, Aged Cab Sam, and it's uh, one of those that has your good stories. So loves of the course. stories on the back. Yes. Uh, Behringer Bros honors the journey of Jacob and Frederick Behringer to a young America, where they opened a wine a winery. That still stands over 140 years later. Fifth generation winemaker Mark Berenger revives his family's tradition of maturing Berenger wine in spirit barrels. This striking Cab Sav, aged 60 days in American oak bourbon barrels, barrels features bold flavors of ripe blackberry, dark chocolate, and toasted coconut with a warm mm -hmm. vanilla finish. All right, let's see. It was the chocolate and toasted coconut where I was like, I don't feel... Like, we've had a wine that has that flavor. Phil was like, it was the chocolate and the coconut that I was like, ooh, finally Shannon won't like the wine. But you know what I do. <laughs> so. That's really good. Yeah. That's actually really good. I like. I think that all of, none of the flavors specifically stands out. Um, no. And so they kind of blend really well. And I'm not a chocolate or a coconut person. So this is, it blends nicely with the vanilla and the blackberry to kind of just make a good, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, you have to know that when I'm asked to pick up the wine, it's more than likely going to be um, some type of barrel-aged wine. It's true. Because um, it just seems to be the flavors that I like the most. Yeah, so Chad had actually already commented, like, as a fan of bur bourbon barrel-aged wines, curious how this one tastes. Well, it tastes delicious, Chad, so you should give it a try. Yeah, it was only uh, like 12 bucks. Nice. Those are my favorite wines. You know, the $12 and under category. <laughs> I'll say this. I almost went because at the HEB on Riverside, it goes up mm -hmm. in price as yeah. the shelves go up. Which I love that. Thank you, HEB, for making it I do, too, because to it's like, okay, I look down at the bottom, and that's where I pick from. Um, but there was one at the top that was $20 for a bottle, and it, but it was smaller. And I was like, I feel like we shouldn't be buying smaller bottles for this. Yeah. The um, bigger, the better. I don't know. You probably could have gotten away with a small bottle today, but <laughs> I feel like I'll appreciate it better um, if we know in advance that we're going to do fancy wine. Yeah. I'm going to be like, that's the day we're just going to bring a charcuterie board and fancy wine, and we're not even <laughs> going to show you all the comics. We're just going to sit here and like talk about comics while we eat charcuterie and drink a fancy wine. And yes, $20 is a fancy wine. <laughs> Yes, it is. It definitely is. Like, I don't even, my eyes don't even register bottles above $30. Anything above that, I'm like, it doesn't exist. That's not world. a real thing. Yeah. yeah. I don't need that. 
Um, cool. Did you do anything else exciting this week? I did not. No. I did not. That's a good week. You had a what not sell on Wednesday, <laughs> both both for yourself and for Bat City. Yeah, it was it was rough. Yeah, that it, was that was a tough Wednesday for me. <laughs> uh, if you are uh, what notters or considering, I don't know if they have like a fan name yet. What notters is what I, I'm going to go don't with. Think they do. Um, but if you are on what not the what not app, uh, Phil does shows when he remembers um, under the app. The comic clerks? Yes, the comic clerks. It's actually me and Nigel. It is. Um, so half the time you're going to get really cool older books, and then the other half it's going to be my collection, which is <laughs> like 90s DC and a lot of weird independent books that nobody knows from back in the day. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it, I enjoy doing it, but at the same time, that's the closest thing to rejection I felt in quite some time <laughs> is putting up books and I'm like, somebody is going to be so thrilled that I'm going to have this and then it's just nothing, you know, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's the that's, beauty of that's the way selling it works, comments, right? I guess. Yeah. Yes. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> I used to actually, when I worked in clothing retail, I used to tell my, I'd have high school, you know, students who would work for me and there was this one girl who Every time, like, I work with her, I'm like, okay, we've got to get your sales numbers up. Why are they so low? And she's like, well, it really hurts my feelings when they don't like the outfits I pick out for them. <laughs> and I'm like, well, did you make the clothes? And she's like, no. And I'm like, did you, like, did you, but, but you picked out stuff that the buyers put in here. Yeah. Like, it's not up to you. You didn't design the clothes. So it's totally fine. You didn't do it. It's, you know, don't be hurt by it. And everybody's got different tastes. If they don't like what you like, just go pick something else. Yeah. It's totally fine. It's not an attack on you personally because they don't like what you like. And she's like, oh, really? And I was like, oh, my God, have you been, like, inter internalizing this the whole time? And she's like, yes, I feel so much better now. I was like, yeah, just tell yourself they have bad taste and then go pick the thing you think is ugliest. And then she's like, oh, okay. And she started doing that. And then it was like her sales numbers went way up. And I was like, your universal taste is what yeah. you think is bad taste. So it worked out. Um, but that said, if you are on whatnot, uh, follow the comic clerks and then also follow Bat City TV because every Wednesday night after our store closes, Matt and uh, Phil go live to sell some stuff on whatnot, um, which is really cool because it's ways to get, if you're not in the Bat City area, it's a great way to get more, uh, you know, in-depth, dig through the bins essentially with Bat City. Um, we've got a lot of new really cool books this week, so we're going to head into those and see what we got going on um first up let's just do it we're gonna start <laughs> i'm gonna let you start with third wave and i'm actually picking to start with third wave issue three from scout comics and i pick i want to start with this because when we finished issue two you were like i don't even know what where this book is going and i uh yeah. it's so it's like so bad 90s tv show that i need to keep going with it so which it is Third Wave 99, so I guess it makes sense it's a 90s TV show. But what'd you got? What'd you think? So I kind of mentioned at the first one when we did the first issue that this is a book that is bad but in a good way. This book is now bad in a bad way, but so bad it's good. <laughs> um, because it continues on with like just I don't. Like, we've known that they were planning a trip to Africa. We don't really know why. <laughs> well, kind of, sort of. So this yeah. is a story of a guy who all we know is he worked for an organization and now he's in the Witness Protection Program. Mm -hmm. And he started a surf shop, but he also started a like um like, like a rehab group, kind of. Yeah, like an Alcoholics Anonymous yeah. support group for through addicts. surfing. Yeah. Um, not addicted to surfing, but like addicted no, to other things. No, no. Yeah. Uh, but you surfing is maybe therapy in some way. Yeah. Uh, and he has this young boy that works at the shop that he's kind of taken under his wing. Um, and then there's, of course, like this um, spies type stuff. We don't really know. I mean, uh, they're like FBI kind of stuff that goes on under the surface. But in the last issue, it kind of starts heading in a direction. And then this issue just decides to not continue on that path and all of a sudden the issue becomes about him sleeping with the kid's mom and how he's okay with it and yeah like he's dating the mom yeah like and it was it's it feels like but it does it very much feels like 90s ep like episodes of baywatch 
like Baywatch Hawaii or something mm-hmm. in the 90s where it's like not even like the main Baywatch it's like Baywatch Hawaii or something right. it does feel like that because it's like oh well one week we're focusing on this and then the next week we're kind of just telling you like a different part of the story and we're gonna hint back to the fact that we were doing this other thing but we're not really telling that same story exactly this week so it's such a weird random like like it it, it does feel like cheesy tv but i yeah. kind of really like the, it it's like if you mix baywatch with a bird notice yes like that's yeah. kind of how <laughs> yeah. i feel like i expect yeah. like a bruce campbell cameo at some point in this like they're just gonna come out of the like kind of woodwork and just have some storytelling aspect into this yeah i i have no clue there's also a giant jump forward in time it seems like because they're on they go on the trip yeah, um, they're on the plane. And yeah, I was like, wasn't there supposed to be like a? We needed some time before the trip happened. And that was kind of the thing that threw me off. Is like, wait a second, you just now introduced that he's dating this kid's mom, but we're just gonna throw that aside and go on this trip and just ignore all that little bit before it. It's just yeah, it's got its it's got its like TV tropey plot holes, um, but in the same way, you're still kind of like, I can't look away, <laughs> like. Yeah. Also, this art right here, this guy that tries to slap him open palm in the face, like, falls. That's, it's kind of, the art's kind of a little off at bits and pieces of this. But, again, it's, it's like watching a train wreck. And you're like, this, this could turn into a really interesting train wreck. You know, I'm a fan of all of those shows that I just listed to say that that's what they were. So, I, I watched them all and I was like, oh, this is cheesy. But sometimes, you know, you just want the cheesy fun thing. And oh, yeah. this book definitely hits that. And I like to play my X-Men pool party song and listen to this <laughs> uh, and get my, like, beach feel, yeah. feel down as I uh, jam out to this and read this book. But, yeah, and it's it's Scout. And this is this is James Hayek, who is the, the guy in charge at Scout. This is his book. And so I love that he's he's got this, like, random weird book that's coming out and then... At the same time, everything else at Scout is so dark right now yeah. that it's like, hey, at least there's this one happy, like, upbeat book kind of thing. Yeah, because uh, someone can get murdered and three pages later they're like, yo, but I cut my first wave. Yeah, you Bird, know? Bro. Or there was, uh, in this issue too, <laughs> the kid was like, I saw a dead body. And she's like, look what came in from Florida State. Yeah. It's like, your son just saw a dead body. Do you not want to discuss this it's at all? It's a Disney movie. Yeah, like, it's yeah. a Disney TV show. Yeah. Or, like, a Disney movie. Like, of Johnny Tsunami. Yeah, it's Johnny Tsunami, essentially. <laughs> but like, with the FBI somehow wrapped yeah, into it. Which, I mean, there we've had that, like, a, you know, witness protection program, like Disney. Like we, it's like Princess Protection Program meets Johnny Tsunami. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, up next from Bohemians, we've got issue two of Dark Beach, which is the opposite end of the series spectra yes it is a dark book yeah um this uh obviously is appealing to me because of sebastian Perez art mm-hmm. um but this is basically um a futuristic i don't want to say a whodunit but it's kind of a not even a murder mystery yeah i'm trying to figure out exactly what to consider this but it's it's very much like there's so much rolled into this because it's a story where we're in the future, uh, the sun is far away. Yes. And there's this group called the Sun Freaks who are b- being murdered one by one. Um, and I kind of thought in this issue we were heading in this like, oh, they're going to give us a huge reveal at the very end of the series who's behind mm-hmm. this. And then that's not the case. No. So it's just kind of like um <sighs> It's the drama to like the cheese factor that we were talking about in in, in third wave. Because you do have like you do have that whole like oh the sun and all of that kind of thing going on. Like the sun we're out of orbit and like you said you have the sun freaks who are people who some of them believe that like we could bring the sun back, but a lot of them believe that the sun was never real to begin with. And we live in this manufactured world now where it's like they have a fake sun, they have a fake ocean, like, they have all these different things for us to, they simulate rain. Yeah. Because we're so far out of orbit, like, everything is just 
has to be fake at this point. And, uh, but yeah, you do have this guy. And I, what an interesting person, too, because he's like, oh, I just take pictures of crime scenes. Yeah. Like, he's like, not a journalist. He's not a journalist. He's not a detective. He's just a guy who likes to take pictures of crime scenes. And yet now he's kind of wrapped up in something that nobody wants to look into. Yeah. And so he's like, well, I guess I'll look into this because it's kind of related to me because I, I was there. And he kind of just is that guy who ends up in the wrong place at the wrong time yeah. in every scene of the book. And yet he is kind of on this, like, okay, well, I have to solve this, like, situation. But in order to solve, like, who's killing these people, he has to figure it all out. Like, right. who are the sun freaks? Who are, like, what is going on in our world? Like, where, how did we end up here? Like, what if this is real and what isn't? And so it does have a lot of layers to the mystery of what we're going to find out. And I'm not going to lie. Like, after issue one, I was like, okay, like, I've kind of seen this a lot right now. I don't really know if this is going to bring me anything different. And then issue two kind of did. Issue two was like, okay, yeah. here's the here's the different twists that are going to make this book different from the other ones that you're reading right now. And um, I definitely thought issue two really brought in a lot more of the story. So I'm excited to see what they do. I mean, not that Behemoth has done anything that hasn't been right. good. But... And, uh, yeah, I mean, it is Behemoth, so I'm already kind of, like, automatically sold on this book. Um, okay, as you were talking, you helped me figure it out. It's kind of like those old detective noirs where it's, like, kind of like the weird out-of-place PI has to go and figure all this stuff out, and you're kind of mm -hmm. unraveling this universe. But I like this universe because there was a little conversation that he has that two characters have in this about theories of what happened to the yeah. sun and i kind of like that he makes this offhand comment about well do you think we ever shot a bunch of rockets at the sun to make it brighter and i was like that sounds so stupid but i could easily see humans yeah. doing that at some point yes and so i kind of like the this world that's being built here and i'm curious i think it's the conspiracy theory side of it that's like i want to come back to this yeah you know, and that's that's what's probably going to be the appeal more than who are the sun freaks? Who's this random guy with a camera? Yeah. You know, that sits on the side of unbuilt size skyscrapers and reads books. Right. You know, like, and I love that. I love that he's just sitting on the edge, like reading books. Yeah. I, it's definitely worth checking out, especially Behemoth. Like, I'll blindly yeah. support everything that they're doing. Um, up next is Ahoy Comics. This is issue two of Guilt. Yes, which stands for the Guild of Independent Lady Temporalists. Which I love. Yes. I love that this is just, this book is a group of old ladies who can travel to, through time. And it's like, there can only be one. Like, it's like the Highlander of old ladies. <laughs> yeah. Essentially, yeah. like, there can only be one, and she can go through time. But, like, once she's going to die, she can pass it on to some other old lady who can go back in time. And it's all based around this woman who feels like the biggest mistake she ever made in her life was getting married to the wrong man. And even though she's lived this life where she's done a lot of really cool things when you hear her story, mm -hmm. none of it is what she wanted it to be. And she's, like, old and she's still on her own and she feels like she didn't get anything. So she keeps going back in time to try to stop herself from making the decision. And we learn in issue two that no matter how many different places she goes back to, she still makes the same decision. Right. And she can't really actually alter major events of time. But she ends up... When she goes back in time at the end of issue one, she ends up dragging her new, like, health person, like her healthcare worker, uh, dragging her back with her. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that that girl was only, like, 11, 12 years old back in the time that she goes back to. So now that person is stuck inside of a child's body. Yeah. And nobody believes her. And uh, I love that. We always see the parts in time travel things where somebody's like, oh, I'm from the future. And they're like, oh, okay, sure you are. Yeah. And this one, she's like, hey, I'm from the future. And they're like, we know you tell us that like once a month. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, how many times has she come back in time? And I did enjoy that that's kind of how they unveiled kind of catching us up. Yeah, how the rules having, work. Yeah, and having her friends kind of explain it to us. Um, I thought that was really well done. I also like that. The little girl told this one guy uh, basically what was happening. And he was like, well, you know, time travel. And she's like, look, I know you believe it. You're a Star Trek geek. Yeah. Like, just don't lie to me. 
but yeah, I this is a really fun book. Um, I also like that her husband is one of those like real skeezy. Um, mm-hmm. uh, what are they like? Motivational speakers, right? Like faux cult member, yeah. like leader kind of things. Yeah. yeah, where it's like, come to my weekend seminar, and I'll help you better your life. Um, so there's like all these really interesting things that are kind of unfolding in this book that I really like. And it's time travel. Like, it's just going to be a fun time traveling book, you know, nothing serious and, um, kind of a little bit of like a back to the future yeah. where it's like, we got to fix things before, before they get out of hand. Yeah. And I do like it because it is at the same time, like it is this, like the independent ladies. Mm-hmm. So there is this, you know, idea of oh well what's the thing that would have been like even more of a revolution well the one thing I could have done differently is I could have like lived for myself instead of some man and then it's like oh but you did all these things and here you're doing this and it's like oh well that guy is skeezy and it's like and then you do have like these the lady best friends who are building her up and then you have like this mentor relationship between these two women and uh, so I'm really I'm curious to see and we see how their paths Inter- have intersected more mm-hmm. throughout time. And so I'm curious to see what that connection is going to bring and what that story is going to do because it is only on issue two and it's already starting to like unfold all these different layers to their right. connections and to like what time travel, like how you mess up time travel, but also how the decisions you make without time travel really like sometimes you, there is no going back because so many people are like, oh, if I could go back in time, I'd change this. And it's like, well, what if you got back there and you couldn't? Right. Because in reality, it's like we always say, oh, what if I would have turned left instead of right and the road was completely different over there? But what if there was no ability to turn left? What if you go back and you turn left and then there's a dead end and you have to go back and you have to go to the right anyway? And it's like, so some things in life can't be changed and it's not necessarily worth dwelling on them. And it's going to be curious to see how they play out this whole story arc with that kind of concept in place. Right. Yeah, I this is definitely a fun one to pick up. Um, you know, it's, and Ahoy too is one of those that I feel like we don't talk about enough because it's yeah. mostly the conversation is around, um, second coming. Yes. And, and, um, my bad. Yeah. And my yeah. bad. So pretty much the, all the non Mark Russell titles kind of fall by the wayside. Um, but yeah, I've been enjoying this one. Two yeah. issues in, I'm, I'm definitely on board. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just got attacked uh, with cuteness under yeah, the table. Yeah, I did, I did too. Yeah. I, I, it tickled a little. <laughs> There's a cat under the table. Yeah. It was super cute. Yeah. Um, up next from Comics Tribe is issue three of Happy Hill. Um, that glossy, glossy cover that we're just yes. getting fingerprints all over. I feel so bad. Um, In a time when Marvel is cutting down her paper quality, <laughs> Comics Tribe is putting out these very beautiful, wonderful comics. Uh, and it's high quality on the inside, too. Mm-hmm. I feel like this is uh, really great. But this is only, like, one of, like, two or three books that they have out right now. Right? Yeah, they don't have very yeah. many titles. I think this is one of the only ones that we're regularly seeing. Um, and if you don't know Happy Hill, um, it's all about a resort that you go to Happy Hill and everything's happy. We don't have staircases. We have slides, like, from one place to the next. Yeah. And nobody has ever been sad at Happy Hill. It has kind of that, like, Disney, like, motto, but put into an, a resort for adults for the most part. I guess there are some kids, but you don't really see them in the story right. much. And we've got these two people who have come to stay at Happy Hill because they want to investigate the... The mis- mysterious story of the woodsman, yes. um, and he is this creature that's supposed to live in the woods who kills people, as one would imagine, from something called the woodsman. And there's always been all of these weird things going on at Happy Hill, and so they have come to investigate it. So we've got them staying at the hotel for that reason, but at the same time, this woman is looking for her daughter who was with her dad in the area of Happy Hill and has now gone missing. And so we've got all these different people kind of trying to investigate what's going on at Happy Hill and all the people at Happy Hill have convenient ways of making people forget that they should be investigating. 
Yeah, it's very much one of those, like, oh, there's a lot of weird, shady shit that's going on underneath the surface, but they're throwing all these big feasts and, you know, slides in your face to where it's like, yeah, even one of the characters sees their room in this one, they finally get to see what their cabin looks like, and she's like, oh, this, everything is so amazing, like, this is a dream come true, and it's like, okay, they've clearly figured out how to do this, Mm -hmm. um, but I gotta tell you, I love this book. Yeah. Like, it just keeps getting better and better. I like the character designs of the woodsmen. Uh, there's also a sequence in here I'll show you that's really cool. Um, but this book is just, it's a lot of fun. It is, and it's one of those books that I ordered out of the back of the previous catalog and completely forgot what it was by the time it got here. And the first issue had that gorgeous uh, foil cover. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't remember what this book is, but I'm so drawn in by this cover that I know I'm going to love it if it's even remotely as good as the, the cover is. And then I was like, oh, my God, this book is so good. And then we just, as we keep going into it further and further, they do, like, more gets unraveled about the Happy Hill Resort. And I'm like, what is going to, like, where are we going with this? Like, yeah. are they controlling the woodsmen? Do they even know about the woodsmen? Are these two things completely unconnected? And... You know, what is the connection if they are like? Well, so there is a conversation in this book about the woodsman's ties to it. Mm -hmm. Um, So they are starting to kind of peel back those layers a little. This was a sequence I was talking about, though. There's a a moment where uh, the guy who's the journalist kind of goes creeping around some of the darker areas and he runs into this this deer. And he has this little moment where he's like, I always wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, and then, of course, like any horror story, it's not it's gonna not... bode well for him. No. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I really like the little kind of horror story that's being built here, mm-hmm. um, and especially to where they left this issue off. I'm not gonna show anymore because the little bit towards the end, I think, yeah, is the Major best part. Of, is yeah. definitely the best part of the issue in terms of like, okay. If there was any doubt that I had after issue two that I wasn't going to keep going with this, which was not the case, like that little 0.1% is now gone. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm sold. Yeah, issue three was so good. And we always say that's our three issue rule if you're like, if you are on the fence, it's like read to the end of issue three and you're probably going to like get hit with something that draws you in. And this issue definitely like followed that because you're like, okay, okay, okay. And then it's like, bam, I mm-hmm. got to keep going. Like issue three was so solid. Um, and yeah, this was one of those, I definitely happy. Hill was like, I wasn't debating whether or not I wanted to keep going on, but they still solidly nailed the issue three, like uh, cliffhangers and punches yeah. and mm-hmm. things like that. So um, if you haven't picked it up, it's comic tribe. I believe we have issues one and two still in stock. So you can come in and, and get started. And I originally thought, because most of the small press books, a lot of them end at three. Mm-hmm. So I was very happy to see that this wasn't just like a, a really, really small mini series. We might at least get four. I think we might see a, even five or six from how this is going. I mean, I couldn't see this. I couldn't see it wrap up in four. No, I feel like we'd have to have at least five. I would prefer to go, I mean, I'd prefer to go 12, but if, I, if we got to six, I'd be excited. I'm, based on how the story has progressed, in my mind, I see 10 issues. Ooh, 10 issues. That'd and that, be nice. I'd be perfectly fine. Even eight. I think yeah. they could do it in eight. I'm really liking the small press eight number, like, yeah. has been really yeah. good, because it fits in one trade, and mm-hmm. I think it, and it's good. It's, like, the appropriate amount of stories, space to to build your exposition, to kind of build your characters, build your world, and then give me a story and a good ending without doing the whole, like, oh, we got to rush to the end now. Yeah. So yeah. Eight, eight seems to be a solid number. Um, speaking of miniseries, issue two of the Joneses from AWA Epshot is out this week. Um, I, I don't think you've gotten to read the Joneses yet, I right? I not yet, no. I, what I like about this book is it's essentially like, what if the Fantastic Four was formed now? Uh, because it's an act, it's an actual family group, um, who they got hit with the superpowers that came out of the Resistance universe. So if you don't know um, the AWA Upshot world, there is the Resistance universe, which is kind of their superhero world separate from all of their other comics. And uh, in the Resistance universe, there was a pandemic. 
and a bunch of people died and the people who got the virus and didn't die all got superpowers and they kind of manifest in different ways and so in this particular family they all kind of got um different powers and it's it's almost like the incredibles because you've got like the strong one and you've got the fast one and you've got like you know and then so it's like kind of like fantastic four incredibles ish um but the dad is like yes let's be superheroes like let's stop crime and the sister's like like the young the daughter the older daughter is like oh let's you know, let's do things to, like, I'm going to beat up bullies, and I'm going to help stop crime. Like, I want to be a superhero. And, the, you know, the son is like, ooh, I don't really want to get it. I'm, I'm scared. Like, what if I get hurt? Like, I don't want to do things. And the mom is like, hey, the neighbors are all talking about superheroes on the Neighborhood Watch, like, app. And they're having neighborhood meetings. And we can't be caught doing this. Like, what will the neighbors think? Like, what is going to happen if people find out, like, what if, you know, everybody hates superheroes, like, everybody's worried about superheroes right now. Like, if we they find out that we're these powered people, they're going to hate us. And, like, who knows what will happen? What could, you know, that's dangerous. And so she's like, we cannot do superhero stuff. And, of course, it's, you know, family drama, so nobody listens to mom. Uh, hardly ever. And the neighbors, the neighbor who they thought was like on their side is, has now started a neighborhood watch group specifically to try to like find anybody in their neighborhood that's got these superpowers and turn them in. And they're getting super nervous. And so in this particular issue too, we find them going to, uh, the parents are going to another neighborhood watch meeting where they're kind of like, Hey, we've got to, we got to do something about this, these superheroes. And they're like, no, like, that's like, do you not see how you're basically just being xenophobic and you're like attacking people because they're different from you? And, uh, you get some really interesting conversations, but we also get our first look at, uh, who their villain opposition might be in this book. Ooh. Okay. Is it Dr. Doom? It's, it's obviously it's Dr. Doom. We didn't, we don't know. Um, but it could be. But I'm really excited to see where this is going to go because AWA has done a really great job of building out their different superhero characters uh, for the Resistance universe, so I'm excited to see where this one's going to lead us. Yeah, I, I, it's one of those that once I can sit down and start Resistance from the beginning because I kind of want to see the yeah. world open up and then dive into it, uh, but it's definitely something I, I want to tackle at some point. As you should. Um, the Ocean Will Take Us, issue two from Aftershock. Uh, this is, this is, um, like I said, it's issue two, so we're kind of, like, just starting to figure out, like, the action of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is all about a young boy moving to a new town, and in his hometown, he's the big, like, big swim leader. He wins all the, like, state medals and stuff, and so he tries out for the swim team at his new school, and they all seem to have like, almost godlike swimming skills. Once they get in the water, they practically turn into fish because they're so fast. And uh, the, he's now trying to kind of figure out, like, what it is that they're doing. You know, he thinks it's drugs or steroids or something um, that may or may not have the coach's involvement, but we know that there may be something more to it. And in issue two, we kind of find out a little bit more about what that is. I don't know if you guys read issue two. I did not. Oh, man. This I, was one that, so when I was digging, I grabbed stuff out of a pile not knowing that there was a second pile. I was still reading. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. so there was a second pile that I didn't see. And I remember, I think it was, we were getting really close to having to start the live stream. And I saw you toss it over and I was like, oh, crap. I really want to read that. But... There's, I have to read these other things first. Yeah, this is one you're going to want to go back and read. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. For sure, because it's a, it's a lot of fun. I love the mystery, like, the things when the kids are trying to solve them. And they've kind of made their own little, like, their reference, not mine, but they kind of make their own little breakfast club of people trying to figure out how to solve this thing. Um, and, and they once again make that joke. And I will once again remind you that kids don't know what that means, so stop using it as a reference point, but it's fine. Or keep making it so kids have to go and watch Breakfast Club. Yeah, you could do that too, but literally they're like, and they make that joke in here, and I appreciated it for that reason, because the one girl's like, it's like in the, do you want to pull a Breakfast Club? And he's like, I don't know what that means. And she's like, we really have to work on your classics. And I was like, okay. Like, that at least you made the reference to, like, 
it is a movie that kids these days don't know. And that it's like, oh, the, the kids who are watching older movies, like, get it. But I was like, because, yeah, there's so, it's been, like, two generations worth of kids who haven't watched The Breakfast Club on a regular basis. So, uh, shame. <laughs> we got to, we got to start with, like, letting them know what that is. But it's, like, all the people who get, grew up watching The Breakfast Club are the ones who are the writers now. So, they're, like, telling that story. Anyway, I love this. I love where this is going. It gets a little dark and crazy um, towards the end there. And I don't want to spoil it for Phil by telling you anymore. Yeah, but I, I started to stop myself from yeah, going on. It's definitely a good story. And I was surprised because I had heard mixed reviews from before I read issue one. And, and then I read issue one and I was like, I like this book. I don't know what people are talking about. This is fun. And if this was an animated show or like yeah. something, I would love it. And it's uh, there's a lot going into this. And I just want to know more. <laughs> it's definitely one of those where I'm like, well, can we have the next issue right now so I can see more? Because I really need to know what's going on. Um, so, you know, Ocean will take us. Get me some more, uh, please. Aftershock. Uh, the West of Sundown. All the movie posters, I'm always like, what does it say? Uh, West of Sundown, issue two from Vault. Uh, this is Universal Monsters in the Old West. Um, is 100% what it is. <laughs> like, uh, we start issue one with a woman who is obviously a vampire and she's living in New York and suddenly she kind of has like a dizzy spell and passes out and she realizes that something that she's lost her, like the dirt from her home, the place where she was turned into a vampire and, and she has to go back to this place. So her and her familiar who is helping her, you know, through everything she, he has to take her back to the old west um well to the west because it's in that time period and so he has to take her to the west and they go out um and they kind of encounter like once they get there we encounter a frankenstein's monster kind of thing and we're hearing about more of the creatures as we go on in issue two and uh she's you know she's got to find her home and we're starting to see like who she was before she was turned into a vampire and what the connection, like, between her and the other monsters might be and how the situation is. And um, I'm just, it doesn't matter. It's Universal Monsters. Yeah. I was going to love it no matter what. But I do like the cinematicness of the way it's done because it very much feels like an old Western movie that you're watching. And it kind of scrolls through it very well with the storyboarding. Uh, but... It's it's Universal Monsters in the Old West. Like, yeah. that's two really cool genres mixed together. Um, and you get this really great story, and it's... I I am so digging this, and I can't wait for you to read it, because I know you didn't get to read this. Yeah, I didn't... I read the first issue, and I... You know, it was kind of one of those in the first issue, a bit of uh, vampire fatigue. Yeah. But then when they were like, yeah, well, maybe it's not just vampires. Maybe it is more of the monsters. And I was like, okay, I, I guess I'll read this. Um, but, I mean, this art looks great. And it's a vault title. Yeah. And it's Tim Seeley. All things that mean it's going to be great. Yeah. it's. Uh, I would be shocked if this book turns out to not be good at all. Yeah. And it's it's already starting to bring in um, some really cool lore and mm -hmm. adding. And I love the way like Frankenstein's monster looks. Um, mm -hmm. I love the things that they're going into. And they're getting, it's getting weird and strange and wonderful um, all at the same time. So if you're a fan of Universal Monsters, if you've been like, we need more Old West books. Uh, if you enjoyed The Rush. Um, if yeah. you've been enjoying The yeah. Rush, this is a great, like, hey, The Rush is coming, kind of wrapping up. Seems like uh, this is a great, like, way to, like, start a new title that might go on a little bit longer so that you don't miss out once that Rush feeling is gone. Yeah. Yeah, and the art. Yeah. I love the art in this book. And those movie posts. I hope and every... the movie poster covers, they, that is, like, the cover A. Okay. Uh, it's, like, the cover A or the cover B of all of them. So, yeah, they're going to be there for a minute. Um... Speaking of vampires and uh, wonderfulness, uh, Rise of Dracula issue six, I believe. Five. five. Issue five. Issue five. Uh, from Source Point, Source Point Press. Sweet. Source Point Press. Uh, all right, Phil, you got to do this because I know you got to kick this off because I know how you love your Rise of Dracula. So this is the sequel. Yes. To, uh, to the Cult of Dracula. Yes. And this is basically what would happen if Dracula decided to take over the world. 
Yeah. Or at least America. America, specifically. Um, and um, this would be the rise of vampires. Um, and it's really great because this book kind of shows you um, this shift of power um, in New Draculas. There's a New Dracula. Mm-hmm. Um, but it also unveils this like really cool story of like the history of Dracula and all these like in the last issue there was like all these really uh powerful women um throughout history that took on this role and uh, this book is just it's awesome it's so great and I still haven't read Cult of Dracula yet right and it, it's, you're not lost not at all. No. No, not at all. Right. They're almost like companion books more than mm-hmm. direct sequels because if you didn't read one, you're not lost in the other one. Um, it's like Cult of Dracula kind of introduces the characters, but we talked about this when Rise of Dracula first started that the cult, the story in Cult of Dracula was a little weak and it was like, it's good, but I'm kind of filling, filling in the blanks for them a lot of the time. And in Rise of Dracula, it's like they were like, okay, so this series was actually popular and people were enjoying it, so let's put more into it and like yeah. really build out this world. And this has been really good. And I love, I love that you get all your classic like characters from Dracula like recreated into this, and you see other things. Um, and I just love that the world is so ridiculously insane in this thing. Like you said, I love that in this world, uh, Dracula is pretty much always been a woman Mm -hmm. and it's this awesome thing where we get to see like all of these females just lead all of the vampires but also in this case all of the world and uh and just how different people lead is interesting because you immediately see those shifts in the way power like who's in charge completely does a like 180 shift sometimes right and um it's, it's it's such a cool book and the covers are always fire like, they have such great covers for this book. Yeah. I mean, I do love this cover. I love this series. I hope that we get this series comes to a close and then we get another something of Dracula. Yeah. Right? Like, now the we're... The fall of Dracula. Well, no. I, I want a period of time where Dracula... Because it, it's great because in this book it's very much like, hey, this world has to change. And we're going to leave a lot of you behind, mm-hmm. and a lot of you are not going to like the decisions that yeah. we made, but these are kind of the decisions that have to be made. So you're like, oh, is she just going to straight up become a fascist? Or where, where is this going? Uh, where is yeah. this going? And then I want to see that that power come into play, and then, yeah, maybe this whole thing wraps up with the fall, you know, and, and humans take over again. Because yeah. it does kind of feel... Like, there's a chance for, not in this series, but maybe the next one. We're hinting at a resistance, but we're not seeing anything yet. Yes. And I think that's that's a super cool idea. And uh, Cult of Dracula was only five issues, and so we thought that this was going to be the last issue for Rise of Dracula, but it is actually not. This is, it it just kind of is like, see you next month kind of thing. So so I don't know how long this series is going to run, but it could be like, if this is Rise of Dracula, we could even do an, another one. Like, he could end at six, and then the next arc could be the Reign of Dracula. Yeah. Like, we could do this for, Rain, we, we could do this a, for a while. We do this all day. Yeah, I mean, we could, we could go on until most eventually vamp- Dracula falls. But. Right. Most vampires are immortal in most mythologies, so we could actually do this forever. Well, and we know that there is always a version of Dracula throughout time. So you could have this story and then eventually move on to a different one. Um, would that be your favorite Dracula book that's on? Like, just Vampire specifically, would you say that's probably your favorite one right now? Not the one, like, Cover of Darkest, Darkness and West of Sunrise, Sun, Sundown are both, wow, I cannot talk. Cover of Darkness and West of Sundown are both universal monsters. So just Vampire. I feel like there's another one that I'm not thinking of. I know, there's so many. That sits above it. And I partially want to say um the sunset one um blood on sunset i do enjoy blood on sunset Mm -hmm. but i feel like there's one more that where i was like this is the vampire book there's bloodstained tea there's blood on sunset there's um i'm like i can't even think of them anymore oh my god you're right yeah there's one i'll have to put on the spot yeah i mean technically there's redneck still around right if you're going to talk about vampire books 
Um, but yeah, there's so many right now, and I I can never decide. Oh, Cult of Icarus is the one that Chad just named. That's another. That one. could be the one. That's the scout one with the the girl that's that's going to like fight like the badass like rocker chick vampire that's like uh gonna fight other vampires. There's a lot. There are so many. Also, it has this nice crush all that covers. Anyway, yes. <laughs> we got some number ones that don't. Maybe mostly don't have things to do with vampires. We got some number ones. We got some endings. Um, oh, wait. We're not there yet. We have two. We have one more not number oh, one. Oh, of course. Go for it. The best not new number one. The yeah. best. One of the best titles oh, on the shelf right now. And, of course, it's Behemoth. Of course. Um, because Behemoth knows the kind of art that I'm into. It's like they, they just know what I want. Um, heavy metal drummer is a story that I can't tell you about it. You just, <laughs> you just have to read it. But I'll tell you this: it doesn't have anything to do with drumming. No. Or really heavy metal. No. Um. I don't it, think either of those things actually have appeared in the book at all. Um. No. Mm-mm. No. Definitely not. Uh. But I'm gonna show you this art, and it's gonna be all you need to see. Uh. I'm not gonna show much because again, I really don't want to give too much away. But, oh, good lord. Good lord. Talk about a beautiful book. Um, if you have not read any of this, I, I need you to pick it up. I need you to check it out. Flip through the pages. This artwork is just immaculate. Um, that's all I'm going to show you. Yeah. And that's all I'm going to give away. I don't know if I have more than issues three and four left in stock. Because uh, one and two flew off the shelves. And I think three I ordered a ton extra of. And I don't even know if I even have any of issue three left. But uh, come look at issue four. Honestly, it's not like that deep of a story that you're going to be like, oh, yeah. man, I'm screwed. I didn't get to read it. Like, just come check it out and, like, enjoy the artwork in the store. Like, you don't even have to buy it. Just come look at how vibrant the colors are yeah. and how cool the artwork is because it's really what it is. Yeah, and, and that, yeah, that's the big draw to me because I feel like even at times, like, I'm reading this story, but I'm like, I really don't care about these characters. Yeah. You know, because it's... um. There's a there was a video game called Hotline Miami mm-hmm. that you could play where you wore different um, animal masks and it gave you a different power and you had to go through these like real small levels and beat up these guys and not get detected and it's almost like the story doesn't matter because it's just like being a passenger on this weird journey you're like I don't really care where this goes I just kind of want to live in this um, I don't know if I'd want to live in this world in particular because it's a pretty well, fucked up world to live in <laughs> um you know uh, there's a moment in this issue where i was like that's disgusting he's yeah. like going around and he's painting um a phrase on alley walls but he's using a headless cat yeah and he's a... just smashing the cat against the wall and i'm like this is so messed up as matt's like petting a cat in the corner yeah <laughs> that's that's my only negative about it and yeah. that's just because i'm such a cat person um, but I would hunt these issues down. Also, I didn't realize this until I read this and we have one more issue, but Behemoth is putting out smaller size yes. comics, which I'm kind of okay with. Yeah. The Behemoth books are all, almost all smaller. Yeah. Um, and weird. it's a thing they started doing recently. I think Heavy Metal Drummer was the first one actually yeah. that was like that. And now all of their books are coming in that weird, like off size. And it's yeah. kind of cool because they do stand out. On the shelf, and they still fit in a regular bag and board, uh, width wise, but they do stand out so like so much differently, like on the shelves because they are that smaller size. But yeah. I mean, Popstar Assassin just ended, and that was Behemoth, and it was regular size, and then it was like Heavy Metal Drummer came out, yeah, and it was immediately a different size. And so, um, maybe it's going to be part of their new marketing thing, or maybe it's their paper shortage solution that they can keep their quality bigger if they go with a shorter amount, like a smaller paper size. Who knows? I'm okay with that. Yeah, whatever it is, it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, BJ just asked if we were checking out the Eclipse. I think it'll be over by the time we're done. So. Yeah, I've had about nine people text me yeah. and it's like, run outside. It's like, I'm kind of busy. Con- kind of live on the internet. So, yeah, it's uh, a big kind and of And I'm blocking Phil's ability to get out. So without him like knocking yeah. me over, he's yeah. not going anywhere. I'll uh, see pictures of it later. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, if you have pictures, feel free to tag us in them so we can see them. Yeah. 
uh, we got a couple endings really fast. So, Human Remains, issue eight from Vault. This is the end of Peter Millie. Yeah, there eight. It is. And that's a that's a big a Vault sweet member. Spot. Vault loves the eight issue series, and uh, this is a great story about what would happen if aliens came down and just completely obliviated any human who had an emotion of any kind, which is all humans. And so we have to kind of have this world where we learn to be emotionless. Um, and that's something we just cannot do. Like we're physically and like mentally and quite frankly, emotionally incapable of doing that. And every time people try to figure it out, something happens. And we've been following these different sets of characters through the story the whole time. And now we get to this, we have this one scientist who has discovered the solution to fi- to stopping it, but the people who have the solution don't want her to share it with the world, and the people in the government and, like, Big Pharma don't want her solution, and then a lot of people in society think that her solution is, like, not for them. And so she's been like, I can save the world, but nobody cares. And uh, we kind of see how that plays out in this. And we see all of the other people kind of come, all the other stories come to a head and how they all connect in this one particular issue. And uh, it was really cool, really cool story. And Peter Milligan just nailed it, like with the way he described just all the different kinds of reactions that people would take to the situation um, and how we would deal with those aliens and not having emotions like as a human as humans like how we do yeah. that and um i love the books called human remains because you know we are looking at like oh the people are like shredded and all this stuff so there are just human remains but there's like a point where one girl like she's like i kept the remains of my husband like that what well, all that was left like um in a jar and then there's like a pastor who's like they keep using you know, coffins, but you could keep all of the re- human remains in a shoebox because that's most of what it is. And then there's another couple that's like, you know, if you take away all the all the emotions from people, like, what of the human remains? And so he brought it into, like, all these different ways to, like, use that, like, work that title into the, the concept, and it was such a, it's so well done. Yeah. So beautifully written. I love the ending. I uh, I was waiting for this one to end so I could to, to read it and trade. If there was any doubt that I was going to pick this up, this cover for the last issue is that's wonderful. Yeah, I that would this would be one of those covers that I'd walk in and I'd walk up to you and be like, "Do you have all these issues? <laughs> um, I want to read whatever this whatever is. this is." Um, but yeah, I mean Peter Milligan. I feel like he was a name that I got into um, when I got back into comics in like two thousand twelve. And I, that was always a name that I, like, mentioned to some people, but they weren't really familiar with. And I feel like he's had a really good resurgence of, like, indie books um, more recently. So I'm, I'm very excited that he's, his name is popping up yeah. all over these small presses. Absolutely. Um, I realize that all of the books ending this week are books that you've been either waiting on or not reading. So this works perfectly. <laughs> uh, I'm... Very sad to say that this is the last issue of Carriers, but I'm very excited to say that it is not the last we're going to see of the Carriers. This is just the end of story one. So, yay, Carriers is getting more. They're even getting like a special little one shot for one of the characters. It's so great. Um, If you don't know, this is uh, Carriers issue five of five from Red Five. That was a lot of fives. They just had to do that. Um, And this is the story of... Uh, some militant carrier pigeons in Manhattan who are keeping New York safe and all the work that they do. And this, uh, as silly as it sounds, it is a very serious book. And it is, and I had not thought of it, it is very, like, it's pretty all ages, actually, even though they're very serious about their job. Like, there's not really too much, because they are birds, a lot, there's not too much violence, and there's not too many, like, there, I don't think there, there might not be any, like, bad words in it at all. Um, because it was listed as one of those, like, all ages books for com- free comic book day, and it's paired with two kids books. And I was like, I guess it's really not, there's not really too much, like, in it that would be a too much for a kid to handle but um it is a great adult book and this last issue is a 40 page giant size finale and because it's red five it's not 
40 pages where 20 of them are ads and 20 of them yeah. are uh, actual story. It is actually 40 pages of nothing but story. And we have this big, uh, the pigeons, the pigeons have been working on protecting New York and they are hit with their largest challenge of the whole story where we get some meteor rock type things flying and falling into New York and the pigeons go out and figure out what they actually are. And we see some crazy, like, intense battles for them. Like, they, they go through a lot. Um, and I love it because, I mean, there's a pigeon who's basically their or oracle. And that pigeon sits at a computer and types things and does stuff. And I'm like, I don't even know how you're typing things right now, pigeon. <laughs> but I love it. It's fantastic. And um, this it's such a good book. And it's so serious. And it's so wonderful. And if you haven't checked it out, uh, come in and ask for one of the free comic book day carrier issues. I am happy to give you one so you can uh, learn about them and then uh, check out the series. And like I said, it is not the end of carriers. I'm so happy to say that there is a, a winter special that is coming out later this year. And then um, we're obviously going to see more of the pigeons as a whole. Um, so thank you, Red Five, for continuing carriers because I freaking love this book. Yeah, I'm glad it's done. I'm going to sit down and read all of it. Yes. And one quick fell swoop. Yes. Um, hi, Uncle Jim. Uncle Jim says hi. Um, so just throwing that out there. And then uh, lastly, in his own image, issue three from Source Point is out this week. And this is the end of the series. And when we... What? Yeah, it's only a three-part series. Uh, and when we read issue one, we were like, oh my God, this is so violent. And I said, but I can kind of see that they're trying to make a point with that violence. And then when I read issue two, I was like, I can see what their point's going to be. Phil was like, I can't read anymore because there was like some, a monkey in it and it was sad. And honestly, you wouldn't have read this issue anyway, because this is one of the wordiest issues of a comic book that I have read in a, like, in there a while. Go. So this was not a Phil story at all in here. However, I love issue three of this book and how much it explains the whole of everything that it did like this is one of those books where like the third act of the story is just the full-on like hey here's like here's it all, here's it all laid out for you like this is everything like we started with the action to draw you in and then we kind of tried to like tease that we were making a point and now here we are and um, the overall story of in his own image is, you know, we've got, we've come to a point as a society where we're like bored essentially with the fact that we have all this power. And so what they do is they start creating these mind spaces where you can go in and you can live out like violent tendencies and violent fantasies, or you can like get robots and you can do this, um, with these robots. And, uh, at some point the robots fight back. And uh, things get really, really dark for the person, the main character, the main dude that we were following. And then in issue two, we kind of see that it's it's more of the story of the scientist and the work that he was doing. And in issue three, it brings those two stories together. And it does bring uh, the story of like working, the monkey's story from issue two back into play. And uh, the story of, of how all these things are wrong. And then one of the things they even say, and I don't want to go too far in it because I know Matt's been waiting for this issue, but one of the things they even talk about is, you know, uh, well, can we ever make a robot that will understand empathy? And can we ever make a robot that won't ever attack people and won't ever go bad? Like, is there ever a point that robots can be created where they won't do that? And they, they honestly say like, no, because We've created these robots in the image of man, and the ultimate piece of man's image is that they are these violent creatures. And uh, and there's this awesome speech about, like, what human nature is and how we are all flawed and how no matter what we create as humans will also always be flawed. And so I was like, wow, you guys not only made your point, but you made your point hard and beautifully done in this issue. And so for all the violence and, like, the, oh, my God, where is this going of the beginning of issue one, issue three, I was like, you could have just wrote issue three, and I would have been like, this is such a well-done comic. But then because you went so hard on issue one, I was like, and that's why. Because you had a lot to say, but nobody was going to listen to that that statement that you had to say if they didn't get through, like, this action-packed, like, violent thing. Because yeah. it is created in the image 
of humans and you have to explain you have to show it through the violence because that's what they right. understand um well done to this creative team in the end for wrapping that in the way that they did because they definitely made their point and did such a great job um with with using this the, the medium for the way it works and storytelling right. narratives so good job i was impressed way to wrap that up i'm surprised it ended so quickly it, it didn't need to be more than three acts. It was a three-act story, and they did it perfectly. Will you fill that up for me before I grab this next book, since you're going to read it, but uh, or talk about it, too, probably? So uh, now we've got some number ones that are new this week. And so um, starting it out, we're going to go with From Silver Sprocket. This is Ish, which is just the one, one and done little... Um, graphic anthology of stories essentially yeah so this is done um by a cartoonist named adam de souza and this is actually a collected um three separate little vignettes um and it says here in the very beginning uh it collects the zines ish which was 2017 and so you write it down 2018 and coda in 2021 so these are kind of um, three kind of loosely connected mm -hmm. um, vignettes. Um, that's it's it's all about uh, like memories and dealing with loss and and grief and kind of going through life and dealing with emotions. Um, this was this was a rough book for me to get through. Um, there were definitely moments where I was very close to tears. Um, that's how I felt about the Coda story at the end, yes, specifically. Yeah. The Coda story was, oh my god, it was, it was fantastic. And the writing on this, like you said, it's just, it's, it's very emo. You can feel the emotion of what they wanted to say and what they were feeling when they made the art and the, the writing. Yeah, and it's it's cool too because like you, it's very like, I don't want to use the term amateurish or amateur style art, but like it does, like it feels like this wasn't, you know, it's not going to have the same art you're going to see in a big mm -hmm. two, but even a lot of small presses. Um, this is very much just like somebody who had to get their emotions out. And I do really like the kind of messiness of it yeah. because it, it shows you that this person was very much struggling with things. Um, including the death of a parent mm -hmm. um, and just kind of having to move on from that. Um, I, like, okay, like this right here, that these two pages, like that doesn't seem like great art, but when you're reading the story, you're like, yeah. I understand why this was done this mm -hmm. way. Um, this is a beautiful book. I, I, I really, really enjoyed this book. I think this is a good representation of what people are doing with comics um that are making it very interesting and also very unique and different this this to me is probably the furthest thing that we've talked about from like your big two yeah like what people view comic books as this is the farthest tail end of that and i think this is it's so amazing there's so many really great pages in this book um and it's going to make you feel things and it's going to make you kind of sit there and also have some self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's necessary. And Silver Sprocket does such a good job of finding these indie artists and cartoonists um, and just giving them a platform to, to put these books out. They're, they're so good at that. And I love the Silver Sprocket books for that reason because we get so many emotional journeys through them and just some really, or hilarious journeys through them as in everything sucks. But we're just seeing a lot of great cartoonists. Um, and like you said, just like actual like pencil work, deep art, like coming in from it. And uh, hi, if you haven't picked this up, you should definitely pick it up. Uh, it's such a good one. These are it's hard sometimes to find the books like these in the store because we don't have a lot of places to merchandise them. A lot of times they end up on the magazine rack or in one of the magazine boxes instead of on the new this week stuff. So if you can't find a book like this ever, like come ask us for it because we do have them and we just might not have a place to put them. Here, I just want to show one more because I do want to show the... There's definitely moments in this book where you're like, oh, this is actually a really talented artist also. Mm -hmm. Like... There are some really beautiful pages in this book, but um, yeah, I would pick this up. 
give it a chance, scroll through it. Uh, it is 15 bucks, it's $14.99, so it's more of kind of like a trade. Um, but I think if you're looking for something that's way off the beaten path, yeah, um, this is the way to go. This is, uh, like, I really enjoyed this. Scrolling through it again, I'm like, I need to read this one more time. Yeah. Um, but it'll be alone. Yeah, more where you can, like, it. have a moment with yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Um, up next, we are launching Opus Comics. This is issue one of Opus Comics' uh, first title, which is a... Bringing back a Frank Frazetta's Death Dealer. Yes. So Opus Comics is teaming up with Frazetta Girls, which is um, uh, Frank Frazetta's granddaughter. Yes. Um, and kind of her new company. And they're basically going to build a universe of all of Frank Frazetta's most famous characters. Um, I think Death Dealer is probably his most famous. It's mm -hmm. the painting that most people kind of turn to. Um, I was talking to one of my coworkers um, about this, and I was like, yeah, the Frank Frazetta painting, you know, Death Dealer. And he was like, I don't know what that is. And I pulled it up. He's like, oh, I've seen that before. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, they're basically going to be telling all new stories with Frank Frazetta's characters. Um, if you've ever read Death Dealer, this gives you everything that you would expect from a Death Dealer comic. Um it's kind of a bummer because I kind of throw this into the same category as um, those sexy lady covers. You know, very much your Vampirella. It's, um, you know, like this story, you get a little bit of that badassness of Death Dealer because he is such a cool character. I mean, it's basically like this Viking warrior that has a cursed helmet. And the helmet talks to him, uh, and pretty much, like, the moment he does, like, a very He-Man moment where he's like, we are Death Dealer, they, they, like, that, the Death Dealer creature kind of takes over. Um, but this issue really bummed me out, I'm gonna be entirely honest with you. I think the art is great. Um, of course, there are those moments where I'm like, I feel like I'm listening to um, old school metal in <laughs> some of these scenes, like, just how badass Death Dealer is. But, like, a majority of this issue is literally him saving a damsel in distress, taking her back to his cave, and then having sex with her. Yeah. And then he fights giant crocodiles. And that's it. That's all of Death Dealer number one. And so it's kind uh, of a classic Death Dealer 90s kind of story, eight, maybe even before the 90s. Like. Yeah, like, you're going to see your scantily clad women... Um, and you're going to see Death Dealer running around murdering everybody with the giant axe. I mean, it's, it's going to tick all those boxes for you if that's what you're into. Uh, I was just kind of hoping that, you know, maybe Fate with the, yeah, the progress of the world that we would kind of get. Maybe this story about Death Dealer and, you know, maybe tack on some like deeper emotional meanings or something like that. I, you're not going to get that from this book. Um, you know, but at the same time, it's kind of cool that... You know, there's this company that wants to take all of these great Frazetta titles and, you know. Bring them back. Yeah, life. give them life again. I, I think uh, a lot of people know the name Frank Frazetta. They've seen his paintings, but I don't think people really know a lot about his career. So I'm kind of hoping that this, you know, kind of reignites that love for um, the beautiful art that Frazetta painted in his time. Um, hopefully these get better. I will continue. Uh, it's kind of one of those books that I just like blindly said, give me all the covers yeah. because, you know, I, I want this to be successful in the sense that I want more of these Frazetta titles to come out and I don't want them to get like two, three issues into this and then be like, well, maybe we don't build out this universe, right. you know? Um, and there's an audience for it. Absolutely. It's just, I may not be that audience. Right. You, know? you might be here for the art and just yeah. adding it into your collection. And I didn't Pretty read much. it um, because I was like, I don't probably know. Probably for the best. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I don't know if I, it's not, I already know that it's probably not my book. Yeah. But, like, I'm going to let you read it because I know it was one that you were looking forward to. Um, but I am kind of also curious at the same time because I didn't read, the reason I was like, I don't know if it's my book is because I didn't read anything like I don't know anything about that world right 
And so I was like, well, I don't know if it's, I I was running out of time. So I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be the person to read this book right now because I won't be able to say like, oh, it was a good adaptation. Uh, it was a good revival or anything. Um, but I kind of do want to go in and read it and see like what it is because yeah. I don't, I don't know the world. And so I want to, I kind of yeah. wish I would have had more time because we had a massive stack this week and there are a lot of books that Phil and I didn't get, neither one of us got to uh, just because of timing. And that was one that I was like, okay, you take this one because you know the world. But right. I'm actually curious if you don't know the world, like where the story falls for you. And so, um, cause I don't have expectations. So I would be curious for, um, and of course, obviously I'm going to have a very strong opinion if it's just damsels in distress kind of thing, but I would be curious to see like what somebody like coming from the outside who doesn't know yeah. the stories thinks. It's just, it's just one of those where like, there's no real lead up to them having sex. Yeah. It's just kind of like, <laughs> oh, you're a, you're a beautiful woman. And, oh, you're this guy that saved us with your big axe. And there's even like, she's like, oh, take the helmet off. And he's like, I can't. And the, the voice in his head of the, the creature is like, oh, now she thinks you're a freak. And then she's like, oh, but I like it. And it's like, what the fuck is this? Like, this is very much like somebody who took the dialogue from porn and then p copy and paste it onto a comic. <laughs> and you're like, this isn't believable. You know, but then he goes to battle with the crocodiles and you're like, this is cool. I <laughs> want to see. This is believable. I want to see. It's consensual too. I, I, it's consensual. Well, yeah. yes. Yeah, it is consensual. But it's very much like this doesn't happen in real life. This is the furthest thing from reality well, that you can get. It's, but it's Death Dealer. I didn't think it was supposed to be anywhere near reality. No, but I was kind of hoping that you come into this and you're like, we're going to build this universe out, but maybe we're going to leave behind some of that. that old way of creating comics. Because this feels to me, and I do not know who this writer is. I, I know he does animation. Okay. Um, and I do like the art, but to me, this feels like a straight white guy wrote this book, you know? Mm -hmm. And he was like, I'm writing this. Like, if there was a begin, if there was a letter at the beginning that was like, hey, this is because we love Frank Frazetta, but also I'm writing this for my bros. Like, let's bro out to this book. That I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. <laughs> like, if he was like, I was in a fraternity in college, I'd be like, okay, yeah, I get it. Like, I get it. I understand why you're writing this book now. But, I mean, if you like, like, the Conan stuff, then... Right, the classic Conan. Yeah, yeah. like, if you like that old school Conan, but you're also just like, uh, where's... Th there could be more to this. Um, Chad said, do you think, uh, since it is that, that basic of this kind of storytelling, do you think it would have been better as a silent comic with no dialogue, only art telling the story? Um, no, because I feel like you do need to get that relationship between him and the voice in his head. It's very, I'm trying, I've been sitting here this whole conversation trying to think of another character that has that kind of evil voice in their head that they deal with every day. I can't think of that character at the moment, but it's very much like, I, I like that interaction between yeah. the two of them, um, because it's, it's just like you know, let me out, let me, you know, very much like Hulk in a way. Yeah. Where it's like, let me out, let me be the violent thing that we are meant to be. And he's like, no, no, you know, I'm, I don't need you. I mean, then how would you compare it to Barbaric, where he has this axe that's telling him, we got to kill people, we got to kill people. Same, same kind of thing. Do yeah. you feel like if Barbaric is more, like, progressive and, like, hits that modern, like, tone that you want more? Because you like Barbaric. A so. little bit. Because Barbaric also does kind of have that, but mm -hmm. it's not... Like, there, there was not a sex scene in the first issue of Barbaric. That's true. Or two or three. Right. Um, whereas this one, it's just, like, right off the bat. Also, she has a child with her. So she's, like, carrying a baby when he saves her. She carries the baby into the cave and... And there's even a moment where, like, Death Dealer's, like, grunting at the baby and is like, uh, and if you're going to be quiet, the baby, like, grabs his finger and she's like, oh, he likes you. And then somehow she sets the baby down and they have sex and it all happens very quickly where you're like, what? 
Where did the what? baby go? <laughs> Where did you put this child? Because this is a giant open cave. So more than likely, your baby is like maybe 15 feet sitting on a rock watching <laughs> you sleep with this like weird helmeted man. Yeah, this weird helmeted guy. It's like, <laughs> okay, fuck? see, I don't know how this works for everybody else, but that almost actually makes me want to read it just for I, the laughs. Like, I, I think you should else. read yeah. it because, like, it's obs. Oh, that's a lot of boobs. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's full on nudity. They're like they're letting you know that they're having sex. Um, it's it's just I I want to see more, and I'm really I'm really hoping that maybe this scene in particular was like, oh, we want to pay tribute and to that old school comic mentality. Right. But I'm hoping moving forward they move away from that. Yeah. And what I really want is for them to say, hey, we're going to take this old school character that was written by a bunch of cis straight white guys and we're going to build on that but progress him forward in some way. While also let him go around and chop dudes heads off with a with an axe. Like, I still want that. Yeah. You know, but maybe tone down all the that 90s valiant feel that I'm starting to get or <laughs> or the... Uh, yeah, like Vampirella and yeah, that kind of that stuff. Yeah, all that dynamite stuff. Um, but I'm glad that there is something with Frazetta's name on it back yeah. in the in the universe. Absolutely. So. Uh, n- another number one, volume two of Devil's Highway from AWA Upshot has kicked off. Uh, I always love when, when I name a book and Matt gets excited in the background. Um, it's my favorite. Uh, yes, Devil's Highway, Volume 2, Issue 1 is out. This is one that I have been waiting. This is one of those like first like five or six uh, AWA titles that we was one of the reasons we fell in love with AWA. Um, such a cool title. And to finally get a Volume 2 is like, oh my God, it's here. But Devil's Highway is all about what if... Uh, people driving semi trucks had a hostile style cult ring inside of their semi trucks, and I mean, because we would never know. They're always on the move. There's no way to like track that. Like there could be all kinds of stuff going on in there. And uh, volume one follows a girl as her dad has been murdered, and she kind of falls into this whole world, uh, where she is like, oh my god, like, this is what's happening, this is going on, and she ends up investigating it, and volume two comes out and is like, hey, remember all of that, like, crazy dark stuff we showed you in issue, in volume one? Well, guess what? We're about to make it even crazier, and you don't show that, don't show that, because I don't want to ruin it for Matt. Um, and so, yeah, so it's like, they are really, like, diving in, and they're like, hey, we're gonna take this even further, and um, if you're if you're enjoying uh, like the Wolverine books and stuff like that, this is Benjamin Percy writing this mm-hmm, book. Mm-hmm. And so um, I highly recommend this to people who have been like, "Oh, I love this." Uh, and honestly, this is the same creative team from Volume One, mm-hmm. and they have not done that necessarily at AWA. It hasn't always been the same exact creative team on a Volume Two, so it's cool to see that this Volume Two is is coming back and. Uh, it's it's good. It's fantastic, and I believe we might have a couple more copies of Volume One of Devil's Highway in stock. And I did not grab one, so um, oh, the trades. Have I the think trades. there may be one up here in the new uh, comic book room. Yeah. Um, but it They're, is it is one of those like nine ninety nine, uh, Volume Ones. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, perfect. Yeah. I, I remember I bought it because we were sitting here one night doing the stream. And you show that was when this came out, and you were like, "Oh, this!" And I was like, "Oh, this looks really cool." I was looking through the art, and I ended up buying it that night. Um, yeah, definitely check this out. Yeah, it's such it's a good a, book. It's a cool story. Yeah. Um, up next, also out this week. Um, oh my god, I was like, "This book is damaged." It's not. That's the, no. that's the art. <laughs> uh, also from Behemoth, issue one of a new title, which is Blind Alley. Yes. Well, you got a massive thing of notes over there, so I'm going to let you go first. I did. Um, because this was one of the first few books I read because it's a behemoth title. Mm-hmm. And so this kind of follows the story of a guy who starts out in the very beginning. Uh, he works for what you assume is the mob mm-hmm. or a mobster. Um, but this is our main character, Jesus. 
and he is um, in the very beginning of this issue is relieved of his duties. Yes. Um, because you're usually told that once you work for the mob, that's a lifelong tie that never ever ends. Um, but they've cut him loose, and he's decided to go back home. Um, his dad owns a bar. Um, he's got a bunch of friends that are all kind of shady characters um, that all live in this town that he's returned to. Um, and this is basically, <laughs> I love this, this guy gives this whole speech about gazpacho um, and how like it may have healing powers. And it's just like, I've never heard anyone talk this much about it. But it reminds me of that scene of the Matrix when he's talking about the steak and it being oh, yeah. real, that whole concept. Um, but I remember, Shannon, you opened this book and you showed me this page mm-hmm. here of his arm. And I was like, oh, this could be really cool. Um, but I don't know how I feel about this book. Um, to me, it's very vague. Mm-hmm. You're given, you're introduced to a lot of characters. Like a lot of his friends kind of start showing up. And, you know, you know, his, you know that his, him and his dad have some kind of a weird relationship. Um And you also get a little bit of that, like, uh, you know, you are a disappointment because you were in the mob. Yeah. You know, you've had some kind of shady stuff going on. Um, But I don't know what to think of this book. This one was kind of, for me, it was a lot like how I felt on issue one of Dark Beach, where I was like, this could go in a direction where I really love it. Or where it's like, okay, we've kind of seen this before, and you're, like, not really giving me the story that I want out of this. And because it is Behemoth, and now I've seen Dark Beach issue two, I'm like, oh, so you're probably going to go in the direction that, like, you really, like, pull out a really good story from here. And so I, I have that faith in it. It does kind of feel like watching a drama, um, slow-moving drama kind of movie. Very where slow. it's like, I, like... I'm getting to know all these characters and we're introducing something and we're into like the first 45 minutes of the movie and I'm like, still don't really know where we're going with the movie. It has that kind of like Oscar drama kind of feel to it. A bit, yeah. In that sense of like, oh, I don't, like you are making a slow moving, you're you're building something. And so I think it's going to end up being in, in that vein of things where it's like, okay, you kind of took a while to get there, but you're going to tell me a really cool story when you do. Um, And that's kind of what I'm hoping. I I literally wrote in my notes, is this going to be a story of just following the main character getting drunk and delivering pizzas, or will his past finally come back to haunt him? Uh, I don't know if that's even going to be the case. I think I'm wrong on both angles. I think this is going to be one of those, like, he comes back to a small town and finds out that Maybe there's something that could be taken care of. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens he's the only guy that can do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting thing. It's his skill set. Is I think his skill set is going to be what comes into play and not his past. Yes. That's yeah. what I'm thinking. Yeah. I yeah. think so, too. Um, but I'm curious to see it. And, I again, I don't think that Behemoth will ever disappoint. And I'm already intrigued by a lot of the characters. Um, see, I hate most of the side characters. No, and that's why I'm like, I hate them in a way where I want to know oh, okay. who see, they are. Like, I don't like them. I'm intrigued right. about who they are and why they're, like, yeah. why everybody is terrible. So, like, well, so far, are yeah. we going to care about them? How are you going to make me care about them? This is what I want to know. Yeah. Because uh, I can feel it happening. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those that, like, you know, as, as long as it's got that behemoth logo on there, I'll more than likely keep going. I 100% know that you did not read this book. I skipped this one. <laughs> because it's got a lot of words inside of it. Yeah. So uh, also, I, I was also getting vampire vibes. There are no vampires okay. in this book. Okay, uh, this is called Buzzard and Bone. It's issue one. It's from Source Point Press. And this is one of the purest witch books we oh, have okay. had. Uh, all of the books that we've had about witches have been very, like, you know, like, flirting the idea of witchcraft or things like that. This is more like the witch, like, of a book. This takes place, I knew that Matt, Matt was going to love that. This takes place, it's, it's it's like if you took the Hatfield and the McCoy story and you made it about witches. It's in that time period, there's two families, they're both these dark, like, witches, like, fam- witch families, and they both have these terrible patriarchs, and... You get the this warring like sense and sensation between them, and I mean they are there's like legitimate times where they're like they show how you build a grim, a, a, a grimoire, 
And uh, they, like, actually show, like, the way the family's process was for building it. And I was like, oh, my God, this is this is some dark, like, like, if you thought Chilling of Adventures of Sabrina was a dark book, uh, this is there. This is in some of those levels of, of dark in situations because they do tell you, like, a lot about the magic. But it's all um, this story around this one, like, this one kid is narrating it and we kind of see a... Uh, yes, Chad said two covens both alike in dignity or indignity because neither of them are uh, <laughs> good people. But we do see this connecting point from this child's point of view. And I'm already ready to know, like, where is this going to go? Because they're like, even like the kids, like the most important thing to remember is and then it's a spell. And I was like, yes. I don't, and it's so deep, and so, it's 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 not a fill book. It's slow moving. It's wordy. It's got a deep story <laughs> of like things that are going to come into play. We've got characters who it's like like the first introduction of one of the characters. Like it's like a family portrait, and their face looks like you know when demons are moving in pictures, and they get that blur thing. Uh, you get that in there, and they like drew that in, and I was like, wow, you did a really good job of like an like drawing in that animation that movies do. Um, they're all bad people and they all make terrible choices and it's all geared in this magic and I'm 100% absolutely completely sold <laughs> because it's all the things that I needed to happen in a book and uh, oh my god and again it's, it's fantastic. I just like that there is something in the industry. I'm, uh, there's one thing that I do enjoy is that now we see like coloring and lettering being done by companies. Mm -hmm. I know And World is kind of one of the big ones we see everywhere. Uh, but this is uh, this is lettered by letter squids. Yeah. And if I ever decide to write my own comic, they are going to be the ones. Letter that squids letter my book. are. Because also the lettering in this, the lettering in this is really cool. I think they did a pretty good job. Oh, there's baseball in it. I'll read it. There's, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's one page of baseball, so there's Phil's one page sold. Of baseball, so I'll give it a go. Right, right. It's slow moving. It's period. It's drama. It's witches. And there's a baseball scene. They made this book for Matt. Yeah. So this is like Twilight, because they play baseball in Twilight. <laughs> they do. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've been waiting all day to tell him about that book, because uh, I read it today and was like, stop talking to me, people. This is great. Uh, here you go, Phil. This is all you, my dude. I did not get to read this. This is what? for you. I didn't. I, I was like, I know Phil already read it, so no. I didn't get to read it. I do have a review from a trusted subscriber, though, so you you go on and tell everybody what this is. All right. Jurassic League number one from DC, if you missed that part. of There, I have sat around for years saying, man, why can't we get something similar to Brute Force? Do you remember Brute Force, the animal superhero team that Marvel created in, like, the late 80s, early 90s? It's a really bad four-issue miniseries, but if you can hunt down those issues, I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, we get something even better than that. Daniel Warren Johnson, who is known for just putting together some uh, beautifully well done books. Um, Wonder Woman Dead Earth mm -hmm. is fantastic. Extremity, uh, Murder Falcon, probably one of my favorite comics ever. Um, and uh, recently, for you Marvel fans, he did Beta Ray Bill. Yes. Um, now he is writing. He's not doing the art for this, he is writing Jurassic League. Uh, which is basically the Justice League set in the Jurassic Times. Um, it's actually, I was I, I was a little concerned because I was like, we're not getting his art, but he got Juan Gideon to do the art, and this art is fantastic. It looks Oh my god, great. I haven't even opened it. Wow. It looks so good. Um, this is your basic first issue of hey let's introduce you to these characters that you've known for a long time uh they introduce you to batman and you get a uh, joker zard um in this uh you get wonder woman which is uh wonder done um and you get superman who is super saurus uh or super sar super sore super sar um, and it's basically their little introductions here. Oh, you also get Aquaman as well. Um, Is he just Aquaman? No, 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 no. He's, uh, I forget, I forget what they call him. Um, I don't even know if they say his name. 
Wait, hold on. I don't want to skip some of this really great art. Yeah, I was uh, like, don't tell him. It'll be surprising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you get to see, uh, you know, Batman and Joker face off. And I don't even actually think they say what Batman is referred to. I think they kind of keep that a mystery. But this is your basic, hey, we're putting the team together. Here's the team. Um, and at some point, they are going to face off. Uh, against a, a giant force. I'm trying to find pages that don't oh have God. ads on them. Yeah, check this out. This is super cool. I mean, look, if you have a kid and you, you keep saying, oh, you should read these characters, and they're like, no, these old characters are boring. They've been around forever. Give them this. It's fun. There's going to be dinosaur puns. The art is great. And, you know, it's a chance for them to kind of get a feel for, uh, look, they're super, they're so super sore. I have been told by Bat City Kids Club member um, Oliver Wilson that this was the pick of the week for him. There you go. And he personally has like 10 books on his pull list and he was like, this is my book. And he loved it. So, you know, if you do have a, a, a child that reads comics in your life. Um, or that you want to read comics, they, this might be, like, this is, like, kid-tested, adult-approved kind of content right here. Like, everybody can get into it. Yeah, and that's, I kind of like that that's the route that they took, where it's like, you know, what more can we do with the Justice League that we haven't already done? Um, and it's, it's entertaining. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Once you get done reading your 19 Batman titles, uh, throw this one in that pile. Uh, it's going to be worth it, you know. Yeah. Uh, last new number one is volume two of Jenny Zero has launched this week. We got issue one of Jenny Zero Homeland Insecurities. Mm -hmm. um, if you did not read Jenny Zero, it was all about a girl who, uh, how do I say without spoiling the whole thing? Uh, you know, she's, right, I was like, just kaijus, but I don't want to, like... Yeah. There's kaijus, there's a girl, it's, you know, like, genetic, hereditary, whatever, yes, like, yeah. uh, that she is predetermined that she has to go into this kaiju fighting life. She doesn't want to do it, she wants to live her life as, like, a drunken, Jessica Jones, surly kind of, yeah. like, person, and she gets dragged into her dad's life, and... Uh, is having to, to, you know, deal with it, and she doesn't want to, and Volume 1 has left us with her making some decisions that nobody's really on the side of, and Volume 2 has us finding her uh, right where she left off. Yeah. We literally pick up right where we left off, and uh, we just get more of Ginny's terribly amazing attitude. Yeah, I mean, nothing has changed. She's still a total... Um, badass asshole. Yeah. You know? Um, and she's great. She's just a really fun character. Mm -hmm. um, I like this kind of new adventure she's been put on. Um, they have uh, like a hive mind um, henchman style characters that are in this, um, you know, and she's kind of set off on this new task and I'm all here for it. I mean, it's got some very interesting moments in this book where I'm like, wait a second, I should probably jot this down and remember this because it could come back to play later on uh, in the series. But I ranted and raved about the first volume of Jenny Zero, which only went for, what, four issues? I think is all mm -hmm. it lasted. Um, and I kind of feel like this is going to be the same, probably yeah. another four issues. Um, there's one bad guy, and hopefully at the end of it all... <laughs> It's kind of left open, but, you know, we're just continuing to kind of peel back the layers of this world. Yes. And I'm here for all of it. Yes. Um, the artwork is great. Ginny Zero, fantastic. I, I want to see this made into a TV show so bad. Uh, absolutely. 100% sold. Yeah. Take my money. Yeah. And this is, it's also cool, too, because they kind of, I'll show this real quick. They go back. Uh, she has her dad's journal. Mm -hmm. So you're going to kind of see some flashbacks throughout this one to kind of give you a history of her dad a little bit more. Which, which I love. Cool. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Yeah, so if you read that first volume, definitely pick this up because it, it only took like the first three pages for me to be like, uh, yes, 
all those emotions I had the first time around with how great this book is. And if you didn't um, read the first volume, it's right there. Yes. We just got more in stock for this moment, yeah. this exact moment, because we have sold out of all of our initial orders of them, so we are uh, on some more. So if you need, so yeah, good. if it's you haven't so read it, good. jump in now. Yes, please, please do it. You, you won't be mi- you. You're missing a lot. Yes. Uh, all right, so we got some picks, and it is a good pick week. Oh, my God, there's so many picks. So many picks that were wonderful. And um, I'm going to let you go first, Phil, because my you book. didn't even need to read it before you already <laughs> like my pick. This will so. forever be a pick of my the pick of the week, even if I don't read it. I'll just show you the artwork. Very much like Heavy Metal Drummer, Behemoth is going out there and getting some wonderful, wonderful creators uh, this is Stargirl. Uh, I know they took out the vowels, like um, one of those new cool trendy things to do. Uh, this is issue two. Um, in the first issue, we discover that there are like these cosmic girl gangs that go around and duke it out for the universe. Um, and we're introduced to our star girls uh, in that first issue. And they kind of battle some of their their rivals, star, girl gangs. And in this one, that battle continues. Um, we discover that there is a big bad. There is a giant villain who has this ultimate, I'm going to take over the cosmos plan. Um, and from what it seems like, it's going to involve giant robots. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, please. Look at this art. Look at this art. I love this art. If you're a fan of like Sailor Moon, if you're a fan of Steven Universe, if you're a fan of like manga and anime, this, it does it all. It hits everything that I would want in a comic book. And again, shout out to the colorist. I think it's all one person who does this book. I think so. Um, shout out to them. Lucas... I, I feel like Mendonca. Mendonca. I, f- I feel like I would say Lucas Mendonca, but then someone's gonna be like, "Well, it's got that the the weird shape, the weird C, mm-hmm. so it may be pronounced um, differently." Um, but yeah, this kind of you get your your star girl gang comes to the rescue of another gang, and or maybe it's another gang, or maybe <laughs> they're all in the same gang together. Um, but you kind of find out that there was some stuff that went down in the past. That they kind of got to make up for. Um, it's so bright. Every time you turn so it, I'm like. It's so bright and so beautiful. This is the first book I read. And I'll be honest, on some pages, they mention these names and they have those, like, kind of weird, you know, like the way Elon Musk named his kids, where it's just like letters and numbers and dashes. Where it's like they say these people's names, and I'm like, I don't remember fully who you are. Um, I'm kind of lost at times. I need one of those, like, um, sticky notes with the string going from what to what with profiles of everyone but it doesn't matter to me it doesn't matter i mean this story could be pointless they could get to the very last issue and be like none of this matters and i'd be like i don't care it's beautiful (laughs) it's so beautiful you're like i'm still in (laughs) yeah like you just give me this turn it into an anime at some point um but please just come in and look at the pages and I'm, I assume you'll be like, this is amazing. Most people have bought it that have picked it up to look at it. Yeah. Um, it doesn't It doesn't take much. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't. That is a star girl. We have a lot of cool girls in this. T- uh, but the next title is it's actually from Image, and it's eight, uh, eight Billion Genies. And it's Charles Sewell, who I love. What a wonderful human. Um, so it's actually Charles Soule and Ryan Brown. And Ryan Brown. Um, so mm-hmm. if you read Curse Words, same creative same team. Same team, yeah. Uh, and Curse Words is great. Yeah. And uh, before I hand it to you to show it, I the whole premise is that, and I'll hold it up like this so while I'm talking, but the whole premise is that everybody in the world is given a genie. At the same time. At the time. same exact yeah, time. An and instant. everybody gets one wish. And I actually just really kind of like this tagline, essentially, for the book. Which is, what would you wish for? Would you ask for something for yourself or take something from another? Would you help or would you hurt? Would you change yourself or change the world? And forget about your wish. What about everyone else's? And 
I I love that as an intro point. Also, I brought the Ginny Frizen cover because it's Phil and I. Yes. Um, so, of course, I did. Shout out to Ginny Frizen for doing the cover. For doing the wonderful, mm-hmm. the most wonderful thing. So, my God, she's such a gorgeous. Such Also, that's just Ginny in that picture. Yeah. That's like a self-portrait with her hair color yeah, and I'm everything. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, giving everybody in the whole world a genie at the same time, like, is such a such an interesting concept. And one of the things that I love that they did in this book is they immediately established the characters mm-hmm. um, and gave us a little, like, one line to two lines of dialogue about each person. Like, we've got a bar owner who owns a bar called The Lampwick, which yeah. we, we're, getting, we're getting a genie story, so that's mm-hmm. great. Um, but he's got... You know, we see a, a kid that he's talking to, and he's like, hey, you're in charge while I go to the back. And he's like, what? Like, I can't be in charge. Right. I'm 12. But then he walks around the counter and is, like, helping people. And he's even <laughs> yeah, like, if yeah. the health department comes in, just give him some money. <laughs> like, it's all these great things. You get a lot of, like, who each character is. And you notice, like, the, you know, the kid's dad is, an, is, is a passed out drunk. And we see these other people who... You know, a band that's setting up and and all the dynamics of this band. And then these genies show up, which we are going by the term genies and not gin, uh, which I was curious to see which term they were going to actually use when they reference them. Uh, but they get these these little almost alien like beings. Yeah, they're and, adorable. Uh, I want one. They kind of remind me of like a blue and like you haven't gotten there yet. Never mind. I was gonna tell you a Doctor Who reference, but you haven't gotten there yet. There is an episode that I need you to watch. Like I need you to catch up because you're missing all the good stuff. Um, but there anyway. This wonderful for those at home, they kind of remind me at the of the adipose on uh Doctor Who, and so. There anyway, this whole thing, I love the way that they're like, okay, well, everybody can make a wish, but you get one wish, and we're flat out telling you that the intent behind your wish is going to shape the way we enact your wish. Right. And right. it's like, ooh, thanks for actually just telling people that up front because people always forget that. And then you still, like, it shows you, like, okay, the first, like, eight seconds of it, of, and it's like 8 billion people, 8 billion genies. And then it's like 8 minutes, the first 8 minutes. And the number of people on the earth has gone down yeah. by like a, hun- a million. And yeah, then, I think it like was. That. And then, uh, yeah, it's gone down by like a million. And then the number of genies has gone down even more than that. Because, of course, I want somebody does their wish, like the genies disappear. Right. And uh, I was like, oh, my gosh. Because you know, like, how many people wish somebody would die. And, like. There's so many moments where it's like you see a teenage girl that you just get half of her statement where it's like, burn in hell. And you're like, you know, she just told her parents, like, I wish you'd burn in hell. And, like, the parents are on fire. And it's so crazy that, like, it's that whole concept of controlling your words and, like, how you're, you're thinking. And the smart way that some of the people interact with it is really cool to see. And I'm already really really invested in what we're going to find out about this Lampwick owner because he is really knowledgeable about things in a very interesting way. Yeah. So I like I'm already like so invested in him as a character that I need to know where this is going. Yeah, I love the character setups. I like some of the little bits and pieces that they kind of throw in there that kind of go along with with what to expect um moving forward. But yeah, I just it's such a great concept. Um, and I like to see what they do with it. It's also one of those things where, like, I had this moment where I was like, you know, if this little adorable thing showed up, I would probably not make a wish right away. I'd probably hold mm-hmm. on to it and want to be, like, its friend. So I'm going to kind of, uh, it's going to be interesting to see this, like, dynamic. But you would ruin it that way. I feel like the people who would hold on to it would accidentally slip up someday and be like, man, I wish I had a glass of water right now. And then you'd just get yeah, a glass of water. Yeah. It's like, yes, you should hold on and think about it. But if you keep it for too long, you're just going to accidentally use the phrase, I wish. And then you're going to get, like, screwed out of your wish. Yeah. And I would totally be one of those people because there's so many times I'm like, I wish I had a chocolate chip cookie. Mm. And I would be like, oh, damn it. I mean, not really, because I'm happy with my chocolate chip cookie, but, like, also, like, is that all I'm going to get out of this now? And I, am I still okay with this? It was, like, the world's best chocolate chip cookie or, like, a giant chocolate yeah. chip cookie. I might be okay with that. But great book. 
um, completely in. Uh, like you said, the curse words team, they're great. I'm a huge uh, fan of Charles Sewell as a person in general, so I will always support anything he what, does. What would you do with one wish? If you had one wish. I don't know, honestly. Yeah. Uh, that lot. That is a lot of pressure. Yeah. Um, like, and they even say, like, oh, are you going to, like, wish for world peace and this and that? And it's, like, it's so hard, like, to figure out, like, how to do it because I also don't trust genies. <laughs> Yeah. To give me what I actually said. And so I would be like, oh, like, this is going to go wrong no matter what I say. So I don't know. Um, can I do this? Can I do this? All right. So uh, up next pick of the week is Bunny Mask, The Hollow Inside, issue one of this new volume from Aftershock Comics. Um, so... If you've never heard of Bunny Mask, you've never been into our store, um, because this is one of Matt's favorite favorite books on the shelves right now. Um, but Bunny Mask is, they always say, what if you uh, essentially became best friends with the, the little girl from the ring, is, is a big thing that they do. Uh, that we've for, all wanted. Right. Who doesn't want to become friends with this, like, demon person? But... Everybody that read volume one of Bunny Mask, which was four issues, was like, what is Paul Tobin doing? Every issue, I have more questions. Like, it's like he answers one question but gives me five more. And everybody is like, what is this book about? Because I love it, but I don't get it. And it's like, yes. Mm -hmm. Like, even the first time Matt read it, (laughs) the first time Matt read it, he was like, Bunny Mask. And I was like, "Uh uh-huh. And he was like, what is going on? And I was like, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's it keep going and uh and it is it's it's this weird like you know a a guy that's a social worker like shows up at a house that like a man has gone kind of crazy and his daughter they're trying to check on the daughter and you know you find out all this weird stuff that the man has done you find out all these strange things about the daughter and then we flash forward to the future and we're kind of following along and now in this volume and then of course we introduce bunny masks who's kind of like this demon thing that just is around i love this volume i honestly think this is my favorite issue of bunny mask thus far uh this new one because we finally are starting to see bunny mask be the central character of the story and we get to see what bunny mask is a little bit more we get to follow bunny mask on her adventures and kind of see not what not necessarily just what the powers of Bunny Mask are, but how they kind of impact uh, the Is world and what the choices. Hmm? No, okay. no, not a spoiler. Uh, so this this issue is fantastic. A, you get that incredible Andrew Meaty art on Bunny Mask, which is fantastic. There's always a little maniac of New York, mm-hmm. uh, like little piece like easter eggs in each one uh but this is it's so it's so good if you haven't read bunny mask uh we will give you a copy of the free comic book day issue from this year literally whether you want it or not when you come into the store uh but you should and you're gonna love it it's crazy it's weird it's fantastic this is definitely one of the best books i agree with matt it's always great and i love when somebody reads it for the first time because they're like that was so strange i'm obsessed with it (laughs) and you're like yes and if you like something that's killing the children or those kind of modern horror series yeah where like the and, and more even so the ones where like the monsters are kind of the good guys yeah um You'll definitely like it because I think that we're going to see a lot more of, like, Bunny Mask, the, like, as not necessarily a bad guy, which we we never seen Bunny Mask as necessarily a bad guy. And the over, like, the overarching question of the whole series, those big questions, who knows if we're going to see an answer to those anytime soon. Um, I don't really care because I love this direction that they're going in. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mainly am here not for questions to be answered, but for Andrea Muti art. So, you right. know, as long as that's the art style, keep putting it out. Absolutely. Um, and then, huh? They might be changing it because the free comic book day issue was Doesn't, different huh? art, but they kept it on the main title. That could have just been for that one issue. Yeah, because it had an it had Andrea Muti mm. like as the before and after because it. Right. parts of it and then it just had a second story and i think that was on purpose because it followed different characters 
because the the different the middle story and the free comic book day issue followed a different character and i think it was supposed to be like hey this is somebody whose view isn't obstructed by bunny mask and this is somebody who's literally on the outside looking in so i think that the whole idea of having a different artist was like if you personally were looking at it at bunny mask from your world view it wouldn't be all watercolory and crazy because I think that that's part of it is that we're seeing Tyler, uh, Tyler, is that his name? Yes. Okay. I was like, am I right? Uh, we're seeing his worldview looks the way Andrew Muti is drawing it because it is so impacted by bunny mask existence. Uh, and I think that that's kind of why they went with a different artist, or at least it's what I choose to believe because I like to think that we, uh, choose the artist on purpose for the storytelling mechanism, but that's just me. Um, lastly, we have from Boom Studios, we have Grim Number One, which is by one of my favorite comic book writers, Stephanie Phillips. Um, I am super, super excited about where this book is going to go. Yes, it also has a Jenny Prison cover. It does also have a Jenny Prison cover, which is why I brought that cover again. Um, this is the story of a girl who is a Grim Reaper. Yeah. She works uh, ushering people to death. And uh, she picks up a person who who doesn't want to believe that he's dead. Um, Matt mentioned, like, oh, Bunny Mask, if you're a fan of something, is killing the children. Way less so on Bunny Mask than this one. Honestly, Julie, if you are a fan of something that's killing the children, I think Grimm is going to be a book that you really enjoy because it, it feels like the narrative formatting of something that's killing the children. Yeah. Also, I will say, too, one of my favorite books, uh, Heavy. If you're a fan of Heavy, this kind of does that same thing where it's like, hey, here's this like really obscure thing that exists, and here's kind of how it's been corporatized in a weird way, mm -hmm. you know, because there's like scenes with them at like lockers together, and all the Reapers are standing around talking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I was not at all sure of what to expect, but I love the character design of this main Reaper. She mm -hmm. looks so cool. Um, and I, I, I liked kind of this whole, like, ushering him over the river sticks and kind of like being like, Hey, this is actually, yeah, this is kind of how it happens as we take you to wherever you're going. But then what's great is when they get over there, it's, it's like the DMV. Yeah. Like you're, it's like you're at the DMV. They're like, here's a number, get in line and they'll tell you where you're going next. Um, uh, but the really cool thing is, is uh, her sight is stolen. Yes. Um, in this issue, and that's kind of what kicks off um, this this story. Um, it's awesome. It's really awesome. I like. I love everything about this book, and it's Stephanie Phillips. So I'm like, the story's gonna be great. Like, I know it's gonna it's gonna have a solid uh, ending. It's gonna be done really well all the way through, um, and they're gonna build these characters really great. Um, also, yeah, there's this, like, 80s rock and roll dude who's a Grim Reaper, and it's like, I want to see more of you, please. Yeah. You know, like, give me the kind of crazy storytelling that's going to happen with this, but also, like, I want those, like, office moments mm -hmm. of, like, them dealing with being Grim Reapers. It kind of feels like the, the scene in Beetlejuice where they go to the afterlife and they get their number and they're like sitting, like Beetlejuice is sitting there waiting, or more so not even when Beetlejuice goes, but when the, the main, when Gene Davis um, mm -hmm. and the Baldwin uh, go and they get it and then they the go Baldwin. and they sit there and they they talk to the uh, they go in and they meet with their like death counselor and she's like, oh well you gotta do this and you gotta do that and like here's your paperwork and here's that. And it kind of feels like somebody, like Stephanie Phillips saw that and was like, all right, let's, let's think about the people who like bring them if mm -hmm. they had to deal with that world and all of that. And I actually, I'm sad there's not a letter at the back of the, the thing because Stephanie Phillips always has like the best reasons for why she's telling a right. story. And so I'm, I'm curious um, what, what they would say would be the point for this book, but I'm so excited. It was funny because I was like, Josh was like, what was Grimm? And I was like, I don't know. She's really excited. So maybe it's Grimm Fairy Tales. Maybe it's Grimm Reapers. I don't remember. I'm just excited because it sounded cool and it has Ginny Frizen covers and it's boom. Right. And it's funny, actually, because there's a Ginny Frizen cover and a Jay Lee cover. So I was like, they are really also feeling that something is killing the childrenness of this. Right. And immediately gave us both of the big something is killing the children variant on it. Um, uh, it's, it's so... Oh, it was such a it's such a good book. 
um, and black letters, which is what you should definitely have when you're talking about death. Yes. Uh, I can't wait to see where this story goes. This is going to be one that is always at the top of my read poll when it comes in because For sure. it's, it's going to be For it's, sure. it's it's, it's going to be great. It's boom. They're not going to do me wrong. No. Um, and Stephanie Phillips. I just literally will make stacks of Stephanie Phillips books and read them over and over again. So. Also, since it is boom, I kind of like to maybe see this be the next something is killing yes. the children. You know, like we we build out this universe and then we can expand from there. Because, yeah. you know, I know that that's kind of the thing now with comic book and publishing is how can we build this universe? Um, and I feel like Stephanie Phillips really hasn't... She hasn't taken gotten a her, universe. Yeah, she hasn't yeah. taken that chance yet. So maybe this is her. Maybe yeah. this isn't one of those where she has a point to tell. You know, maybe yeah. this is her like, let me take a crack at universe building. Yeah, we don't really get a lot of ongoings from Stephanie Phillips. Mm-hmm. Like we get a lot of miniseries. A Man Among Ye is still going on. True. Um, but that is a universe that already exists because those are true people. Right. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, cause you know, like Harley and all that, like that already exists. And so it's like, I'm, I'm curious to see Stephanie, um, get to actually build it because one of the things that I love is all these, Stephanie Phillips has these great stories and these great concepts. And so I'm always like, I want to see this go further right. and we never get to actually see, um, we never actually get to see it go even further and so i do hope that this doesn't is not a mini and we actually get to see a big thing but you know what something that's in the children was only supposed to be 12 issues when it started there you go so who knows uh and uh speaking of incredible stories about people who usher people into death i said this on tuesday that this was my pick of the week and then <laughs> the uh artist slash right the creator of this entire book shared my post about that saying oh my god this book is out like the book is out guys go yeah. get it um and that is the first time we have a trade i think in a book of the week which is this beautiful hardcover of carmen from gilliam marsh uh and image comics this was one of phil and i's top books of last year total it was my halloween costume yep. Uh, and it's an absolute sunny book. I actually opened it. They do come, uh, wrapped, like shrink right. wraps. I opened it because I wanted Phil to be able to show you the art because yes. Gilliam March is incredible. Uh, also that new art on the cover that was fantastic enough. Uh, I was obsessed with it. I've been putting it in people's hands and then I actually walk around just hugging it in the store <laughs> half the time. But this is the story of a girl whose job it is to help usher people from when they die to the afterlife and she's not particularly good at doing her job in the fact that she kind of just wants to give people those last moments on earth and it's like you know maybe they don't need to die and maybe it's not my job i know there's so much that you can't show of this story there's just a lot of it's a lot of nudity uh, the girl dies in the bathtub so it's hard to like and that's show kind stuff. of a gilliam march thing is you know drawing um, yes naked women but normal naked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Normal naked, not super busty. Yeah. Like, it's very, like, in a real world, um, you know, uh, ways that he does it. But, yeah. you know, it, it, what was the, we were talking about Laura. Laura. Mm-hmm. And, and he even mentions about how he draws women a lot. Um, <clears throat> but, I mean, it's just, it's spectacular art. This was such a, oh, here we go. Like, if you have never read or seeing Gillian March's art, this is a good place to start. Absolutely. And you get a beautiful hardcover for twenty four ninety nine. I mean You need it. Yeah. You need it. Yeah. I already knew I was gonna buy it because it was a hardcover, but then when you showed me this cover, I oh was like Oh my god. I was like, Yeah, this is gonna look very beautiful on a shelf. Yes. I would um, get a face out and like so I could look at Carmen at all times. <laughs> yeah. Such, so good. Yeah. Uh, those are our picks of the weeks. We've got some in stocks that we are going to fly through really quickly for you. Um, some great ones, starting with a uh, Nightmare Country, which is issue two from James Tynion, uh, Lissandro, who does uh, Redneck, and the Dreaming World is done by Sorrentino. This issue. Ooh. So look at that. <gasps> look at that Sorrentino we'll show art. Real quick. I figured you would. Right. Uh, if you are fans of the Sandman universe, this is James Tynion playing in the Sandman sandbox. So it's, I don't know what else you could possibly want with artists, uh, with Lissandro and uh, Sorrentino on your art. I don't know what, I literally can't come up with what else you could want. If this isn't it, I don't know. 
Yeah, I'll go, uh, I'll go back and read issue one now, just so <laughs> I can read that. Uh, Wonder Woman issue 787. We are past the child of the Amazons and dealing with the fallout. Uh, last bot standing from Transformers. This is the Transformers equivalent of the last Ronin. Um, we've got Paradise Towers. This is a, uh, from the pages of the Doctor Who, um, show. We've got Paradise Towers and Omega. This is issue two of for Omega. We've got issue 10 of Noctera. Uh, love, love, love this book. Um, Naomi, issue three of six for season two, which we won't actually possibly not see as season two of the show because the shows were all canceled. But we could see those Discovery shows going somewhere else under new contracts now that they are Discovery. And I think that's why they is, are canceling I think they're canceling them just yeah. to get new contracts in place under Discovery. Uh, Batgirls is back again with this awesome AAPI variant. Love it. Moon Knight, Black, White, and Blood, issue one. Oh, my God. If there was one character who needed to have a Black, White, and Blood book, it was Moon Knight. Ooh. And, oh, look at that. Look at that gorgeousness. They're not going to show him. Phil's just going to enjoy it on his own. Here, I'll show you this one. Wait, is that? Oh, it's uh, Chris Walker. For a second, I was like, uh, is that Sorrentino on it? <laughs> Put Sorrentino on a Moon Knight Oh, book. my God. That would be incredible. Please, Marvel. If there's one thing I could ask for you to do, put Sorrentino on a Moon Knight book. Uh, issue 13 of Crossover is out. If you didn't see Donnie's tweet this week, this is not the end of Crossover. This is like, we're, we're still pushing forward. A lot of people have been like, are you wrapping up ever? Like, when are you getting there? No. Uh, issue 17, I believe, of Seven Secrets. Uh, the book that I will continue to yell that you guys need to be reading because it is so, so good. <laughs> Tom Taylor is doing fantastic. You should be reading it. Star Wars Halcyon Legacy issue 3 is out. What if Miles Morales issue 3 be and what if Miles became the Hulk? Uh, no Holds Barred issue 6 from Behemoth. I, I guess that's actually the last one that wasn't the small size. Yeah. Um, and that is a, a Shakespeare. What if Shakespeare was Adam West Batman? Or what if Adam West... Like, literally, it's William Shakespeare as an Adam West Batman. It's the ridiculous cool, and though. it's hilarious. But it is told in Shakespearean terms uh, and dialogue. It, issue 11 of X-Men is back. This is the Jerry Duggan. Uh, time Before Time 12. This is another one of those that I'm like, wow, that's still good. Uh, uh, Batman 123. This is, we are, we are Batmaning. We are we're Batmaning. Getting close to the end of Williamson. Yes, we're too. almost to Zadarsky, which I believe is June or July. Mm -hmm. uh, Captain America, Symbol of Truth. We've got a, a new Sam Wilson Captain America title. Uh, Hulk versus Thor, The Banner of War Part 1. This is the uh, Donny Cates crossover, essentially. Not to be confused with Donny Cates' crossover that we just told you was on issue 13. <laughs> This is, yeah, this is him taking the two characters that he's writing. For Marvel. And, and crossing them and into crossing the, together. This battle. art's cool, though. Yeah. I like this art a lot. I don't know who this artist is. Because I kind of pretend like Marvel doesn't have actual artists. And they're just robots that draw pictures <laughs> on um, digital pads. Which is not true, obviously. Batman, Urban we Legends. We don't know. They're run by Disney. We don't <laughs> it know. It could be, but we know Ryan Otley is doing that's the whole true, art. That's so true. That's you true. do know. Uh, I Am Batman. Oh, that's Batman Urban Legends issue something that I can't see. 15. 15. Uh, I Am Batman issue 9. Blood Syndicate is back from Milestone Comics issue 1. Uh, it's like the last milestone, I think, to come mm -hmm. back. Future State Gotham, issue 13. The only Future State title still going. Justice League versus the Legion of Superheroes, issue 3 of 6. Superman, Son of Kal-El, issue 11. Uh, also, Tom Taylor doing great things. Shang-Chi, issue 12. I'm so excited wow. that... Wow, good for Shang-Chi. I was just going to say, I'm so excited oh. that it didn't get a mini... Like, yeah. it's not another mini series. They were doing a lot of, like four issue miniseries for Shang-Chi pre-movie and now they realize that everybody loves Shang-Chi so they just kept going. Uh, Sumerian Hour of the Dragon issue three for once again for Conan fans. Uh, Farmhand issue 17. G.I. Joe's Saturday Morning Adventures uh, issue three. This is kind of coming to the end of G.I. Joe for uh, the IDW world. Uh, the Kill Lock issue three. Norse Mythology from Neil Gaiman, issue four. 
Nottingham is continuing on. It was not just those first five issues, six issues. It is on issue seven. Uh, the Scorched, issue five, with another one of those cool homage variants. Todd McFarlane, always with the Marvel homages, even though he won't work for Marvel anymore. Uh, and then Red Room Trigger Warnings. Uh, issue three, three, I think. Took yeah, a minute three. to get there, but we did get there. Um that is the books that we have in stock. I'm very excited. We've got some trades in stock, and we're going to talk about them really fast. Um, we got trades. Uh, first up, we've got the Marvel vs. Jane Foster, the Mighty Thor in stock, and this is going to collect what, Phil? This collects a Thor uh, from the 2014 series number two. All different Avengers number four, Thor and Loki double trouble three and four, and materials from Thor annual number one from 2015, War of the Realms Omega, and Journey into Mystery 100 from 1952. Nice, nice. Did it say it had the what if? I wasn't listening. The what? No, it does no, not. No, it doesn't include have the, the what if. What if. Hmm. I, um... Which is kind of. Odd. Yeah, I assume that would include the what if Jane Foster became Thor issue just to remind people that that was a thing from like way back when. But all right, I'm in either way. Uh, like I said, we have the uh, Nottingham trade if you want to go back and catch up with Nottingham, which is all a very weird like, uh, you know, retelling of uh, Robin Hood and the Free comic book day Nottingham title had Andrew Moody art, which was cool. Yeah, I saw that. That was neat. Yeah. Uh, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur Girl Moon. This is not new. It is just back in stock, and it is the only Moon Girl trade that you can still get in print. <laughs> like, like that four. I can order is Moon Girl in, for a minute. We've got some stuff coming up. Uh, for Moon Girl soon because she's gonna have a new series coming out with Miles Morales and Moon Girl, but uh, we gotta we gotta time. Uh, this is the Hawkeye Kate Bishop story. If you are like, ooh, Hawkeye Kate Bishop, I love it. I want to see. This is a great way to jump in on some Hawkeye. Uh, we've got King of Spies, the Mark Millar book that just wrapped up as well. Uh, this is, you know, the old guy who um, needs to retire as a spy, tries to retire as a spy, ends up taking down everybody who didn't agree with him. Yeah, he's like, oh, I, I'm going to go on one more mission and just kill everyone. Everyone. Just everyone who needs to go is going to go. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, comic book news slash uh, things in stock. We had the incredible Jacob Phillips stop by this week, yep. um, which was awesome. If you don't know, Jacob Phillips is the artist on that Texas Blood and New Bern. And what a lovely human Jacob is. Oh, my gosh. Like, that is just, that is a cinnamon roll of a human. Just <laughs> absolutely fantastically nice. Super sweet. Needs to be protected at all costs. Uh, love Jacob. And... Uh, Jacob was so much fun to have in the store, and he signed every single copy of That Texas Blood that we have in stock and every single copy of New Bern that we have in stock, uh, and also signed all of our copies of That Texas Blood The Trade, which is kind of sad because, like, they did come in with a little crunch when mm -hmm. they came in, but they only got here. Like, we needed to restock, and so that was our restock box, and I was like, oh, I'm not going to miss the opportunity to sign one. I'd rather have, like... Some of, like, if I had to get this one with this little tiny crunch right here, I'd be okay with it just because it's still signed by Jacob. It's the inside, right? Uh, yes, he signed the inside. Yeah, he signed this first. On, on the, first on the single issues, he signed the covers. Um, on the trades, he did sign the inside. So, uh, but it's really cool. He was telling me that uh, they, he and um, the, the writer, like, flew to Texas because they have not actually ever been to Texas uh, before. <laughs> To do, like, research and everything for the thing, which I, you can't tell. I feel like Jacob does a great job of drawing West Texas. Oh, yeah, definitely. But they flew in and met in Houston. They did a sign at Bedrock Comics and a whole thing. And then they drove to West Texas. And uh, if you've read that Texas Blood, there is a sheriff named Joe Bob in the, in the book. Well, Joe Bob is not a sheriff, but is actually a real person. 
and is friends with the writer. And so they all stayed at Joe Bob's house oh, and got wow. to, like, experience Marfa and all the West Texas area out there uh, by staying with people who are actually, like, from the area. And I was like, did you see how great of a job you did? And Jacob was like, I have so much work to do. I feel like I didn't capture all of the, like, there's so much more that I feel like I missed out on. Uh, I feel like I've done a terrible job of capturing West Texas. And I was like, really? Like, I've lived in Texas my whole life, and I feel like you're doing a great job. It's like, there's just so much. It's so expansive. There's so many different things. Like, it's such a interesting place. I have so much more I can do. I'm so excited uh, to do the next arc of it. And I, I don't know if I'm actually even allowed to say any of the other stuff about the next arc that he told me, but uh, super cool. And then they, they drove from West Texas all the way down to Austin um, and came in and signed books uh, here and at Austin Books, which is super cool. So uh, shout out to Jacob. Thank you so much for stopping by. Um, we uh, One of the coolest things Jacob said, uh, Jacob and, and his girlfriend, they were both here, and they were standing in the store, and they were talking about how great the store was and how much they love it. And then they started talking about how our store looks exactly like Sean Phillips' studio. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, Sean's got good taste, apparently. Uh, love, to, love to hear that because we're all big fans of, of Sean as well. And so it was great to hear that, that uh, Sean Phillips' studios set up like right. our store. Uh, but thanks again, Jacob, for coming. Thanks for signing. If you do need signed copies of New Bern or That Texas Blood or That Texas Blood Volume 1 Trades, uh, you know, come pick them up. They're here for the He signed time. everything. He signed it all. So as long as... That is here, and there is, he did say there is going to be, we're hitting the break point for New Bern. Okay. Because that Texas blood is going to come back, so it's actually lined Sweet. up perfectly. So there's a, a break in the arc on New Bern, and then we're getting uh, that Texas blood back. I'm willing to accept the break for New Bern, if it means more of that Texas blood. Agreed. Um, all right, so we've got some comic book news. I don't actually know if I have any news other than what's coming out this week. You got any news? Did anything happen this week? Uh, Not that I know of. Yeah, I'm like, I can't remember what day it is right now, nonetheless, but what what happened um, this week. I've been in a, a, like, a focus on some, like, business side stuff that I feel like I haven't seen anything. Um, but the Jacob was, like, the big moment, the big highlight of my week. Uh, so I guess, I guess here we are. We're going to talk about some, what's coming out this week then. Um, and kind of skip over that. Chad's probably got a list he'll drop in the comments if he's still watching, which I know he was. Um, but I'll go through some while I'm waiting for that. Um, we've got A Town Called Terror, issue two. Coming out, uh, Bolero, issue five is out this nice. week. Um, I Hate This Place, number one. Rain, number five. Uh, King Spawn, number ten, is out. Slumber, number three. New Masters, number four. Breakout, number two. Very excited about Sweet. that. Uh, Team T, the best of the Rat King. Uh, Electra, Black, White, and Blood, number four. Eternals, 12. Um, Immortal X-Men, two, which I know people have been waiting for more of that. Uh, the Mar Marvel Voices is out this week. Uh, New Mutants, 25. A lot of people have been waiting for New Mutants to come back. Um, uh, oh, see, look, he said, uh, Chad said he doesn't have... A thing you always I need the DC Chad if you're watching if you're fast enough get me the DC because I haven't pulled that yet uh Savage Avengers 1 Spider Punk 2 Thor 25 Lethal Protector issue 2 is finally out uh the uh where did I lose my spot uh excellent issue 3 finally back again X-Men Red issue 2 Alice Ever After issue 2 is out I'm so excited the a uh, continuation of House of Slaughter with the new creative team and the new direction of the story. Issue 6 is out for House of Slaughter. Um, Blue Flame issue 8, which I was just thinking this week. I wonder if there's going to be a new issue of Blue Flame. Uh, Corollary issue 2 is out. Covered, Darkness number 5. Heathen number 4. Hit Me number 3. Kaiju Score volume 2 issue 2 is out. Life Zero number 4. Speed Republic number 4. Uh, Nightwing 92. Thank you, Chad. That's a big one. Earth Prime Stargirl uh, is out. Uh, and I'm very excited that the Knighted trade, uh, paperback comes out this week for my WA Upshot. I've had so many people have come in and been like, what is the Knighted? And I'm like, oh man, it's the Santa Claus meets Batman. And they're like, do you have more issues? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, because I tell people it's the Santa Claus meets Batman and they buy it. Can't like, but the trade is coming out soon and it is, it's coming out this week and it's an AWA trade. So, you know, it's going to be nine ninety nine. uh, super excited. 
to have that one coming out. It's going to be great. There is a lot of other books. I, again, I don't have, all, I didn't pull all the DC because I thought Chad would have my DC for me. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's some, some good, good books coming. I'm really excited. It's, it's just, it's, it's just a hell of a time to love comic books, man. Yeah. Like, most definitely. we're just always, there's always something good. I can't wait. Um, other than that, uh, you know, you got anything else, Phil? No, I, I even looked up news online. The only thing I saw that people were talking about is, uh, uh, Marvel doesn't have the rights to Conan anymore. Oh, shit. So there'll be no more Marvel-based Conan comics. It looks like, uh... King Conan number six in July will be the last. Um, it's going to Cabinet Entertainment, um, which I'm very unfamiliar with that company, but uh, it says that they have intentions of of continuing on with Conan comics, but they will not be with Marvel anymore. Weird. So, I wonder what Cabinet Entertainment uh, is. Yeah, it's owned by um, Frederick Malmberg, which is the co-founder of the Swedish role-playing game publishing house Target Games, and he's also the CEO of Paradox Entertainment. Um, they own uh, Cole, uh, Solomon Kane, Mutant, Warzone, so a bunch of those kind of similar to Conan. All right. Um, so yeah, if you're a Conan fan, maybe it's time to hop off and hop on to that Death Dealer title if you want to get that uh, right. Conan while you style. while you have a, l a lull before yeah, more Conan yeah. comes your way, right? Because you were getting like two or three Conan titles with Marvel, and now yeah. you, no wonder that makes sense why they've been doing so many Conan titles that they knew they were losing their rights. Mm -hmm. They were probably trying to get all their stories wrapped up. So wow, that's crazy. That's huge news. Huge news, Phil. Way to go. <laughs> That's what happens when you Google comic book news. Yeah. That's all I saw. You know, so. you you know, somebody's got to do it. I usually do. You did a great job. You nailed I, it. You know, that's something that I should probably do. I should probably try and put together some some news every week. I usually take screenshots of uh, of news on LinkedIn because I'm friends with all the people who are running mm. all the publishing companies on LinkedIn. So okay. when they announce all their different stuff, like I usually take screenshots and then I just go through them each week and like I'm like oh man there was some cool stuff this week yeah. uh, like I said I was in um, like tax world all week long so I don't even yeah. know anything I just feel like Unikitty from the Lego <laughs> movie like numbers 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 business yeah. business business like that's all I know right now um, except I don't have an awesome kitty well I do I did have an awesome kitty helping me I was say I didn't have an awesome kitty helping me but I did um Oh, uh, Marvel announced a Ghost Rider special issue for the 50th anniversary is what Chad said. So that's a cool one, too. Um, well, there you go. That's our news. It was awesome. It was a good week um, oh, for comic week. books. I'm so comics. excited. And uh, you know what? We're going to do it all again next week. So we will see you in the shop on Wednesday for new comic book day. Uh, as always, we're closed on Monday and Tuesday. If we don't see you on Wednesday or throughout the week, Phil and I will definitely see you, or whether you'll see us, here um, on Wind Down Your Weekend, Sunday nights at 9, uh, live on Facebook or up on our YouTube channel. If you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe uh, for more awesome content coming your way from Bat City. And uh, catch us on Whatnot Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Uh, Bat City TV. Come check us out, and uh, we'll see you then. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.